For SMU, the good old days were too good to be true. College football's Icarus soared to incredible heights, only to plummet into the deepest abyss. Since the infamous death penalty more than three decades ago, SMU has become the ultimate cautionary tale, surviving on the fringes with only modest success. That is, until now. All the way here in Tampa, and you can hear the echoes these days of Dandy Don and Doke and the Pony Express. ESPN College Football is presented by Sling TV, and SMU rides a 4-0 record into Raymond James Stadium. Its best start since that year, the clocks were striking 13. Today, it's SMU putting that perfect record on the line against South Florida, the American Conference opener for both. And welcome to Tampa, and Anish Shroff alongside Former Longhorn Ahmad Brooks, Chris Budden is down on the field. Well, we like a resurgent story in sports, yep. and SMU has been one this year, 4-0, best start since 1984. They've done it with Texans and transfers, and a lot of these transfers are Texans coming home like quarterback Shane Bouchelle. Yeah, Shane has stabilized his team at the quarterback position and also in a leadership role. And some of the things that have made him bad to the bone this year, you haven't seen in his game in years past. Let's go to his pocket mobility and his patience. Here you have an opportunity to see where TCU has a three-man rush, and they, as the pocket is caving in from that left side, he feels the pressure, steps up in a cozy pocket, and moves swiftly and smartly while making the throw to Robertson. Big gain there, and that actually led them to an opportunity there in the first quarter. He comes back here. Now, this is a big 16-yard scramble. Nowhere to throw. Everyone's covered up. What does he do? He scrambles for 16 yards, which sets up SMU's final touchdown run. Still needs to work on those moves, the coaching staff says, but that's been the difference in his, in his game. Um, Shane Bouchelle is now using his feet, buying time, and also beating people with his arm. Bouchelle, a former Texas Longhorn, his head coach in Austin, Charlie Strong. Only one season together, Strong's last season, and Bouchelle started as a true freshman that year. Those two reunited, but on opposite sidelines today. SMU won the toss. They will receive the opening kick. Trent Schneider sends it into the air, and the dangerous C.J. Sanders will watch it go deep into the end zone as we say hello to Chris Budden. Well, Shane Bouchelle still has a ton of respect for his former coach in Charlie Strong, telling me he was a man of high character, a family man, and a lot of the reason that he went to Texas. So when Bouchelle's name popped up in the transfer portal, Charlie Strong gave him a call. Now, Charlie told me I didn't think he was going to come here, but I might as well pick up the phone. A lot of coaches picked up the phone to try and recruit Bouchelle, but at the end of the day, Bouchelle telling me it was an opportunity to play close to home and more importantly, an opportunity to play right away for a team on the rise. Arlington native going to the school, branding itself as Dallas's program. On first down, Xavier Jones tripped up at the line of scrimmage for no gain. Tavares Bellamy with the stop. It'll bring up second down. This is an SMU team coming off a top 25 upset last week at TCU, a win that's generated a considerable amount of buzz for this program. Michelle will throw and completes on second down, a gain of four yards for James Prochet, who leads the American Conference in catches. And that's just great defense there from the Bulls. And now you, you put them in a third and medium situation. Bouchelle has been money in these situations, but the Bulls are going to press. They're going to be very aggressive on the perimeter and make sure that everything stays in front of them and that these lines have these, these wide receivers have to fight to get off the line. South Florida finally getting set. Bouchelle's pass is caught. Reggie Robertson tackled shy of the marker. And a fourth down coming up for SMU. It's just outstanding. And you watch it here. And as they come out, just nice movement. And he nearly picks off that ball. And great open field tackling by Sells to prevent them from getting to converting there. And that's a great start for the Bulls, stopping one of the more explosive passing teams in all of America. SMU was 50% on third down coming into today. Warren Scott punts it away. KJ Sales will let it bounce. And it rolls out of bounds near the 30-yard line, a 37-yard kick. 
Jordan McLeod will make his second career start at quarterback for South Florida. Going into the season, Blake Barnett, the former Alabama quarterback, was expected to be the guy. There was no real controversy, but this offense struggled in two games against Wisconsin and Georgia Tech. McLeod came in late in the Georgia Tech game, started two weeks ago against South Carolina State, and that win two weeks ago is South Florida's only win. They're coming off a bye week. And off Jordan Cronkite. And he is across the 35 to the 36 yard line. Cronkite averaging only 1.8 yards per carry, and this was an 1,100 yard rusher just a season ago. He gets it again, and there's a penalty marker. False start. Offense. Not all 11 players came to a stop and got set. Five-yard penalty, second down. Ahmad, this has been an issue for USF early on. Nine penalties against Wisconsin, nine more against Georgia Tech. Even against South Carolina State, they had six. Yeah, and a lot of that, that starts with your quarterback. You, you've got a freshman quarterback. We addressed this. Our crew did yesterday with Charlie Strong, and he said the thing that's been most frustrating is that those aren't aggressive penalties. Those are things that they can clean up. Not much running room this time for Cronkite. And it'll bring up a third down. This is the best defense SMU has had in years. Yeah, I, I like what they do on the perimeter. They've also got two safeties that are stout to be lids on the back of that defense. And they've got a linebacker, we'll talk about him today, Patrick Nelson, who's very active and likes to blitz in these types of situations. Nelson's the guy, two and white to watch here for SMU. Four-man rush. McLeod checks underneath, completes the pass. Not much running room for Terrence Horn, and three and out go the Bulls. That's a great job of tracking there from Armani Johnson at the cornerback position. Just getting over the top of that route, that is a difficult route to defend, especially when they're trying to drag underneath a bunch of traffic there, but he sifts through it, makes a great tackle, and now both offenses off of the field after three and out. Schneider to punt the 29-year-old Australian a left-footed kicker who worked eight years in construction. Oh, boy. That's tough work. I did it one summer before I went to the University of Texas. I'll never do it again. He did it for eight years before <laughs> South Florida. Prochet back deep. SMU bringing some pressure. Prochet with a chance here inside his own 30. Down the sideline and out of bounds shy of the 40-yard line. Scoreless. Both teams with one possession. That man is having quite a Saturday. You're watching the American Conference on ESPN. It's the conference opener here in Tampa between South Florida and undefeated SMU. Both teams exchanging a pair of three and outs. Second offensive possession for the Mustangs. They come out in a two tight end to look. Shane Bouchelle, the conference leader in passing yards, looking for Galliard. It's tipped. Galliard catches it off the deflection and brought down by Mike Hampton. A gain of 17 and a missed opportunity for South Florida. Uh, no doubt about it. And, and Hampton just guesses on this route. They're in their RPO package. And, and Shane Bouchelle doesn't have great arm strength. That time struggling to get it to, to the outside. SMU going quickly and a gain of 10 for Xavier Jones leading not just the Mustangs, but the conference in rushing. Back to the air, Galliard again. Got a nice block on the outside. And a speedy slot receiver pushed out by Nick Roberts after more chunk yardage, 23 from Myron Galliard. This is where the pace of play can really get on you. And if you're the Bulls right now, their defense coordinator, Brian John Marie, has to call plays extremely quickly. Looking for Robertson, he makes the catch. Wrapped up by Sales inside the 10. Reggie Robertson leading the AAC in receiving yards. One of the top receivers in the league a season ago. Began his career at West Virginia. He's a smooth operator. Gets in and out of his routes extremely well. and One of Shane Bouchelle's top targets. Red zone now for SMU. And this is an area they can be better. Robertson motions. 
Jones gets a good block from Ryan Becker and Xavier Jones with the first touchdown of this game. The tight end clearing the way. And the Bulls right now are just disappointed. I mean, this drive started off where you should pick off a pass, and now you come back, and they really started to press the gas. And SMU with some good fortune. But Xavier Jones, when I watch this kid on film, he's, he's a powerful runner. He's strong. Um, and at 208, he runs like he weighs a lot more than that. He has just tied the great Doak Walker for fourth on the all-time touchdown wow. list at SMU. 31 career TDs for Xavier Jones. Becker clearing the path. Jones finding the way. ESPN College Football is presented by Sling TV, the best of live TV, and get thousands of top shows and movies on demand. Paul Lane, a former SMU cheerleader, has not missed a Mustangs game, home or away, in 47 years. Today, his 512th consecutive SMU game. There have been some incredible highs, but the last 30 years or so, there have been a lot of lows. And if SMU wins today, they go back to the boulevard for next week's game against Tulsa with a chance to be ranked for the first time since 1986. It's, that's, a, that's amazing, and it certainly brings back some great memories of the Pony Express and some of the better times uh, for this university. Jaquez Evans to the 20. There is a flag down. During the return, holding, return team. That penalty is 10 yards from the end of the run, first down. Second penalty on USF, and again, that has been problematic in the first three games of the season. SMU had some glory days years ago when Don Meredith and Doak Walker were there, and then, of course, the Pony Express, Craig James, Eric Dickerson. The death penalty in 1987 crushed the program. Since then, they've had a few winning seasons. June Jones put together a string of winning seasons, but they have never reached the heights of success that they last did more than 30 years ago in the days of the Pony Express. On first down, this is Johnny Ford, moved to wide receiver this year. He was terrific as a running back a year ago. He's a playmaker, Ahmad. They have to find a way to get him the ball in as many different ways as they can. Yeah, and the coaching staff was adamant. Kerwin Bell, the offense coordinator, said, we'd like to get him double-digit touches. And he's the guy that they believe is the man-beater. He can beat one-on-one -on -one coverage no matter where you put him, and they'll be looking for him today. Empty look here on second down. McLeod will keep it. And pops ahead to about the 15-yard line. A third down now for USF. They have not been great on third down this season, only 31%. And, what, and I like what they're doing right now with offensively. They've got four wides in, which makes it a lot easier for this freshman quarterback to be able to decipher pre-snap, whether it's man or zone coverage, because they will mix it up, um, SMU will. And so I think right now he's doing a good job. Watch for the quarterback draw in these types of situations. There's the pressure from Pono Davis. McLeod gets rid of it, completes to Bryce Miller for a USF first down. I'm going to tell you what, that's a big play. You know, you've got pressure in your face. You're avoiding. He, he moves naturally to his right in most cases. But this is a good ball. Not giving up on the play, and now your team converts. And you've got a little momentum going as you convert your first first down of the game. Five receiver look. Now Ford back in the backfield gets the call. Trying to bounce around his blockers, and he's spun down by Patrick Nelson, who has been living in the backfield early in the season. Yeah, he's, he's got speed, and, and, and there have been times where when you see this guy, I mean, it looks like fire is coming out of, out of his shoes when he's running. I mean, 
He's a little undersized. I don't think he plays linebacker at the next level when you talk about his specs. He's six foot two sixteen. Probably projects more as a safety at the next level, but he is a playmaker indeed. McLeod under pressure and blown up. This is just outstanding. Gary Wiley, number 55, doing a nice job of not falling for the ball fake. And this is, what, this is the problem with RPOs. When you run them, you've got one passing option. If that thing's not open, you've got to either tuck and run immediately because looking back across the field now puts pressure in your face. And that's exactly what happened. Great defense there from SMU as they put the freshman quarterback in a pickle here with a, a third and long situation. This is not his strength, uh, throwing the ball downfield and converting in these types of situations. Watch Nelson off the edge. McLeod downfield, man open, it's caught! Cronkride out of the backfield again of 31. Whoa, I mean, just put a sock in my mouth there with a beautifully placed thrown ball in an accurate location and I mean he threw this like a veteran right on the money as they got the matchup they wanted with their running back on Richard McBride their linebacker now this is Cronkright again and he pushes up into SMU territory to the 46 McBride is starting again at middle linebacker the Auburn transfer in place of Richard Moore Moore was SMU's top tackler a big piece on this defense He's out for the season. That's a big loss. But but now you're looking for a guy like McBride to step up. I, I think he's got, he's capable of that. And, and, you know, there, he was lost in coverage. He ended up taking an inappropriate angle, and that's what allowed Conkright to get over the top. Nelson blitzing off the edge. McLeod down the sideline, incomplete. Armani Jones had the coverage on Randall St. Felix. St. Felix, you got to make that catch. Uh, that's the one-on-one -on -one matchup. He made the right decision as you watch the end of this play. And this is, a, this is a ball where he's just giving his wide receiver a chance. I mean, and it literally hits him in the numbers and he drops it. One thing I'll say, he tried to catch it with his chest. Catch it with those hands. Make sure you secure that catch before you come down. Trayvon Sands into the game at running back. McLeod gets rid of it. And there's old reliable Mitchell Wilcox. The tight end, who's the most prolific pass-catching tight end in school history, a first down for the Bulls. Well, he's an NFL prospect. I mean, 6'5", 245, he can block, he can run, he's got great ball skills. They'll use him in line, off line, spread him out, and, and they're converting on a third down. So momentum here offensively. And Sands able to move forward to the 35, tackled by Zach Abercrombie, a grad transfer from Rice. One thing, you know, Kerwin Bell brings an offense that has a ton of multiplicity. And you've already seen different formation sets. They line up in four wides, then they'll come up in an ace formation, two tight ends. And it's hard for a defense sometimes to understand the personnel. So uh, let's watch that throughout the course of the game because right now it really is confusing uh, the Mustangs. McLeod looking for Wilcox off his hands. It's third down. You mentioned Kerwin Bell, new offensive coordinator for South Florida. Sterling Gilbert left to take the head coaching job at McNeese State, and Bell came over from Valdosta State, where he had a high-powered offense that won the D2 National Championship a year ago. They averaged more than 500 yards and wow. more than 50 points a game. <laughs> oh, boy. Kelly Joyner in the backfield, third and seven. Pressure from the edge, again, down the sideline. Incomplete, good coverage by Johnson, and it's fourth down. That's outstanding coverage. I mean, I'm gonna tell you what he read is, he was in the prime location, as there's an injured man down on the field. Looks like Richard McBride, that would be a major loss considering Moore's already out of this game. He just can't take that loss. Hopefully for the Mustangs, this young man is okay. Richard McBride walked slowly off the field after going down before we went to break, went right into the trainer's tent, and SMU again being hit hard by injuries at that middle linebacker position. Richard Moore, their top tackler last year, out for the season. Now McBride out of the game. Delano Robinson does come in at linebacker for SMU. 
It's fourth down. South Florida will go for it. Five-man pressure. McLeod will run. Gets past Robinson. He's got a first down and more into the red zone. Jordan McLeod with his feet. This is a young man who played running back all the way through his freshman year of high school, then moved to defensive back, then quarterback. Didn't start at quarterback till he was a high school senior. That was an out there. outstanding decision. I mean, who cares about the run? It was the decision he made. He didn't wait. He didn't hesitate. And oftentimes when you've got a young quarterback, some coaches will take their natural ability to run away. And Curran Bell has done a good job of just letting this kid play and guiding him. That time there, it worked for him. 41, Preston Ellison in at linebacker for SMU. McLeod looking for six. It's caught. Did he complete the catch? He thinks he's got his foot Jacob down. Mathis <laughs> thought he had it, but it's ruled incomplete. Let's check out this replay and see if he can get one of those feet in. Great ball skills. I mean, this ball is thrown a tad bit late. If he throws it earlier, it allows him the time and the space. That's a good call. And definitely a great call as Armani Johnson forces him out of bounds. Foot landed out of bounds first. Second down, Cronkrite up the middle to the 13-yard line. They're waiting for him to get going. Cronkrite began his career at Florida. He's got four of the 15 longest runs in school history, but his long run this year so far, just 10. And not all of that is on him. The offensive line does have to play better. Anish, this is the 16th play of the drive. They, they've had the ball for 77 yards. They're rolling. McLeod to the air. End zone. Intercepted. Rodney Clemens with the INT. And South Florida, like a, a writer, penning pros beautifully, but just can't punctuate. You know what? It, 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 and, and they were just narrowly missed being a ranked team, but. This is what makes SMU so good. I mean, that is an outstanding coverage on one of the top tight ends in the country, not just in the American. As Wilcox, he just gets he just gets bodied up by the smaller six foot 205 senior Rodney Clemens out of Katy, Texas. Outstanding interception. Not only does it take points away, but it gives it back to this offense that seems to be rolling as well. And that'll be a pick uh, and a memory for him a long time to come. The takeaway streak continues for SMU. Clemens wears number 23. That number has been handpicked by the coaching staff for one player every year since 2009 to honor Jerry Levias, the first African-American to play in the Southwest Conference. Bouchelle to Robertson. Gobbled up immediately, flagged down. An eligible receiver downfield, offense number 14. He was covered at the snap. Five yard penalty, we play first down. Yeah, that's Ryan Becker. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's tough because uh, you know he's a guy that they move on and off, but you've got to check in with the official off the line of scrimmage. And, and those are penalties that you just don't want to make. And not that that play was good. It may be a good thing that they got an extra down because uh, the Bulls totally sniffed out um, the, the, the quick passing game to, to the boundary. Bulls showing blitz. Bouchelle moves the pocket, throws to the field. Prochet broke the initial tackle and fights his way to the 30. He's going to be close to a first down, but there is a flag at the end of the play. Personal foul, face mask, defense number seven. 15-yard penalty, automatic first down. Another penalty. That's three in this first quarter now on South Florida. Yeah, and Mike Hampton, who dropped an interception in the last scoring drive, now comes back with a costly penalty. And, you know, and, and Shane Bouchelle's gotten a lot of credit, but Prochet and Robertson have really given this offense a boost with their playmaking abilities on the edge. Two of the top receivers in the conference. Jones out of the backfield, good blocking up front. And Jones had a nice legion to spring him for a gain of 12. I'm glad you mentioned the blocking because all three of the Bulls defenders were locked up and engaged um, with uh, Mustang blockers. Going quickly, Bouchelle back to Robertson. And we've seen this throughout the season as we get another flag at the end of the play. The downfield blocking is a strength for SMU. Their receivers can block. Oh. 
holding offense, number 14. 10-yard penalty, replay first down. Now sometimes they skirt the rules. <laughs> Well, and on Becker's one of those tight ends. He can't wait to get his hands on those pesky DBs. And, you know, the rule of thumb is you want to get your hands inside. Oftentimes when you get them inside, the officials don't call that because they can't see it. It's when you get them on the outside and on those shoulder pads and, and that they rip away and you see the, the jersey pull is when officials like to, to bring out those flags. First and 15, Robertson in motion. Bouchelle, swing pass to Robertson. Changing direction. And gets close to the original line of scrimmage, second and long. Reggie Robertson transferred in from West Virginia a few years ago and really opened the eyes of this coaching staff to the transfer portal and what it could mean for SMU. They've mined it well. This is Jones mining for yards right up the gut. And it sets up a third and manageable, a gain of nine. I'll tell you what, the Bulls are not handling right now is the pace of play. I mean, it's just really wearing on them. And, and as SMU continues to press the gas, it makes it extremely difficult. That time there, they weren't even set up uh, for the run, and, and Jones just pops one right up the middle as you've got a third down now. It appears as though they're going man-to-man, -man, one free, one high safety, meaning they're going to try to take away the run here and force Bouchel to beat him with their arm. They'll run it. It's Jones. He breaks free. See you later. Touchdown, Xavier Jones, his second of the day. Wow. <laughs> if you're Charlie Strong or Brian John Marie, the defensive coordinator, you don't know what else to do. I mean, you've got eight people in the box, literally. Look at the, the numbers here. And you don't stop the run. And as a matter of fact, it pops out for a touchdown. And that's just poor defense. And, and that's not the coaches. That's the players not executing. And uh, as SMU takes full advantage of it and now it takes a commanding lead at, at 13 to nothing. Extra points have been an adventure. They've missed five this season. Russell Roberts on for the PAT. They are two for two today. Xavier Jones, a fifth year senior, battling injuries most of last year. He's been one of the best running backs in the American in 2019. SMU head coach Sonny Dykes talked about starting fast this season, a big point of emphasis. It starts in the weight room for this program. Well, 14 points already in this first quarter. Xavier Jones, a couple of touchdowns. Meanwhile, South Florida against FBS opponents this season, they've managed just one touchdown this year. That's not good. And, um, I think when, when you talk about Kerwin Bell and his offense and how complicated it is to learn, they're just trying to get their guys to be loose and, and to play without thinking. And that's been the difficult thing when you've got, you've got a literally an NFL-sized playbook with numerous plays, formations, sets, and responsibilities for these players. And, and normally it takes about four or five games before they really get a grasp of the offense. USF will take it out at the 25-yard line. Tonight, Ohio State in Lincoln to take on Nebraska. Game day was in Lincoln I'm this, ready for this morning, 7.30 Eastern. Buckeyes who have been bulldozing their competition. They've had Nebraska's number the last four meetings. This be the marquee win for Scott Frost as he tries to turn around that Huskers program. I'm going to tell you what's going to have to return, and that's the black shirts. I mean, they are going to have to play a heck of a game there in order to stop Justin Fields in this offense because Ohio State, despite having Urban Meyer, uh, they've just continued to roll, and Justin Fields, one of the better graduate transfers, or, or transfers, I should say, in the portal has paid big dividends for them. Cronkright on first down. Picks up a couple good news for SMU. Richard McBride, who went down on the last drive for USF, is back into the game for SMU at linebacker. That is a big deal. And, and it, you know, the injury got friendly fire there. Got, he gets rolled up on, and to see him back in the game, I'm sure the SMU staff is, is excited about that. And then now, on the opposite side, uh, Jordan Cronkright has to come off because his helmet comes off, and so um, two, of the, two of the better players missing a, a play or two. McLeod rolling out, looking downfield, throwing downfield, intercepted again by Clemens. His second of the game, he's got three on the season. And now SMU to the sideline where they have the turnover table service. <laughs> 
poorly thrown pass here. Just, I mean, way under target. I like what they're doing here. Try to get him on the move. And he, he doesn't have a great arm. I mean, and I think you see it there. After the interception, after the play, unsportsmanlike conduct on the intercepting team. Number 23, 15-yard penalty, first down. Now the penalty Time on out. Clemens, the senior, the captain out of Katy, making his 42nd straight start. There's the bottle service, and this was the penalty. Yeah, a little, little spike of the ball. I don't know about that. Come on, man. Yeah, sometimes That's I the feel second pick of the game. I, I, I get it, you know, but are you, you can't serious? legislate emotion, right? I mean, was he supposed to lay the ball down? That's a great play, though, rolling underneath coverage despite the poor throw from McLeod. And then popping the cork on the uh, turnover table service. <laughs> Jones turned back. I don't know about you, when I was in college, I was too broke for table service. <laughs> of course I was. I was a student athlete. <laughs> Bottle service, I should say. Yeah, and they, you know, these, you've seen it spread like wildfire. I really enjoy this. I, I think it's a fun part of, of the game, and I love that the coaches are getting involved with it and letting the players do what they want to do uh, after a big, a big takeaway. Back on the ground, and it's Jones again. Sends up third down and about two. This keeps them right on schedule as if you're the Bulls, you've got to get up to the line of scrimmage. And if you're Brian John Marie, the defensive coordinator, you keep it simple. So does SMU give the ball to Xavier Jones north of 70 yards already in this first quarter. And they have found success also on the right side of that line behind Morris and Bryant. And they just keep going back to the well. And, and if you're the Bulls right now, you've got to put a plug in this. Somebody's got to make a play. Someone has to step up. Despite them being tired um, after not getting a lot of rest, as uh, the first quarter comes to an end, this was probably the best timing for this defense. SMU was flashing a wildcat look to take that quarter down to the final seconds. Xavier Jones, the big offensive star, he's got a couple of touchdowns. Rodney Clemens, a couple of picks. All Mustangs in Tampa. From Tampa, Florida, you're watching ESPN College Football presented by Sling TV. SMU off to its best start since 1984. 4-0 and up two touchdowns on South Florida. The Bulls have not beaten an FBS team since October of last year. First down, it's T.J. McDaniel, the freshman out of South Lake, Texas. Came into the season in the red shirt program, then in his debut against Texas State, eight carries, 159 yards, three touchdowns. He still may red shirt, but that is now a fluid situation. Bouchel going deep for Prochet. Breaks it in with one hand. Did he stay in bounds? They will debate. It is a catch. Whoa. <laughs> Two flags down back in the 30. Might have a late hit. And this is what SMU does well. I mean, let, let's have a look. I mean, First he calls foul, that thing. Roughing the passer. Defense. That's a number catch. 45. 15 yard penalty. Automatic first down. I can't tell if his elbow hits before his knee, but Bouchelle standing up tall. And throwing that ball downfield, this team is great at it. I mean, you start to look at some of the numbers with them throwing the ball 20 and 30 and 40 plus yards. They rank among the nation's best in those categories. Now they've had a couple of road wins already this season, beating TCU last week. Uh, this is a catch. A great call by the officials. This is a catch, and I think they made the right decision. My question was, Anish, what, did his elbow go down out of bounds before those knees did? But his knee was clearly in bounds. Great ball skills, beautifully thrown ball. I mean, if you're a DB and you're Mike Hampton, there is nothing you can do. He holds on to the football. I think this play stands. Now, they are looking at it. Chad Morris a couple of years ago told us James Prochet is the type of wide receiver that could play at Clemson. And Morris, remember, before he took the SMU job, yeah. was the offensive coordinator at Clemson and had Sammy Watkins and Nuke Hopkins 
Some pretty good wide receivers there. Take one more look at the very end there, Ahmad. Is that ball secure? But it doesn't move. Now, it can hit the ground as long as you keep it secure. And, I, and right here, you don't see it move. I mean, he's on it. He's on it. And we're showing so. you slow-mo. For the officials, when they go into this replay it's process, they have to call it in real time. Yep. The slow-mo doesn't matter because it's in real time. Does he make the catch? And like you said, with the ground, you can use the ground. The ball can hit the ground. You can't use the ground, essentially, as a third hand to help secure the football. Yep. And that looked like a catch to me. And I mean, as, as I studied and broke down film of, of this team, one thing that stood out that um, Charlie Strong and his staff noticed, but also that that um, Sonny Dykes recognized was Bouchelle's ability to throw the ball downfield. And, and that was part of the reason why they made, they, why they married these two. After further review, the ruling on the field stands. First down. Yeah, I think that's the right call. And, and kudos to these officials. I, I'm, not, I'm not one to give officials a lot of credit, but, but on that particular play, they got it right despite it being so close. And remember, the roughing the passer penalty means 15 yards tacked down to the end of the play. So SMU now inside the 15, knocking at the door again. And this USF defense right now milling in retreat. Michelle is cooking. He's eight of eight, 8, 99, eight. 90 yards. Came in leading the American in passing yards. We'll check with the sideline. Jones, two touchdowns in the backfield. He gets it on first down. Jones scampers out of bounds at the 11. Some good blocking by 14 and White Ryan Becker early on. It, it was, and now he moves out to, you know, the outside, and that's what makes him so difficult to defend, uh, his versatility. Back to Jones, stutter step, and taken down at the 10, a short gain. Third down here. And remember, SMU with the inconsistencies in the kicking game, their top kicker, Kevin Robledo, expected back today after missing the last two games with a groin injury, but we saw Russell Roberts attempt the PATs today, so this could be four-down territory. Bouchelle, plenty of time. Now he'll tuck it. Bouchelle reaching forward a yard shy of the marker, and if you're Sonny Dykes, Ahmad, do you go for it here? You roll the dice. <laughs> And he's keeping his offense on, and in fact, he's bringing in some more muscle and Becker, Ryan Becker, the tight end. Great decision by Bouchel. That, and I, we talked about it early on in the open, that's what's made him different. You know, his freshman and season, his freshman and sophomore season, he'd have thrown that ball and it might have been intercepted this time. He tucks and runs as uh, USF now calls a timeout. And I think it was the right call to make, for sure. As Bouchel and this Mustangs offense, I mean, they are galloping all over the Bulls. Fourth down, and let's see if Sonny Dykes decides to go for it. He and Charlie Strong went head-to-head -head a few years ago when Strong was at Texas, and Dykes was the head coach at Cal. Came in Freeman, the short yardage back. 5'11", 230-pound senior, chiseled out of marble from Texarkana in the backfield with Bouchelle. And Bouchelle will determine where this ball is going. He's dissecting the defense right now, trying to find favorable numbers. USF loading up the box. Bouchelle rolls to his right. Has Prochet, who waltzes in. Another touchdown for SMU. The Mustangs are for real, folks. And on the outside edge, they run what is called a rub and a pick route as Bouchelle boots to his right or moves to his right. And the tight end just comes in and he takes an angle where the safety or the linebacker's at, which allows Prochet to get underneath. And even if you go over the top, you lose because now you give them space. If you go underneath, you're behind. A real pickle that it puts you in with that route, and, and SMU executed it to perfection. Now the PAT, and Roberts' kick is good. So three for three today on the adventurous point afters for SMU. Mustangs, after an early three and out, have been rolling all downhill. James Prochet caps another scoring drive. SMU's offense humming 
and some early missed opportunities have haunted South Florida. Yeah, you go back to the first scoring drive, and the cornerback, Mike Hampton, has an opportunity for a 14-point swing. He picks this off. He goes to the house. And they, they come back. They score on this drive. And then you come here. You jam all the numbers in the box, expecting the run on a key and critical down. And the running back goes untouched. So despite the score being 21-0, South Florida has lost opportunities. And you're right, Anish. They also had a 16-play drive that ended in, I believe, in an interception in the in back the of the end zone. zone. Yep. So, you know, it's that type of thing when, when you have a young team like Charlie Strong has right now. You're hoping that they, they don't lose their confidence and can come back out here and still fight and make this a game that's close. Evans from his own end zone. He'll stay put. They made the change, South Florida did at quarterback a couple of weeks ago to the redshirt freshman Jordan McLeod and talking to the coaches, they said they felt they needed a spark offensively. He was the guy that teammates and players would rally around. He gives this offense a running element as well, which Blake Barnett can't do at the same level. The early returns were promising, 55 points in a win against FCS South Carolina State, then a bye week. Yeah, but today, a couple of interceptions, and now a 21-0 hole for the Bulls. Cronkright on first down, ambushed. Gets out of it and gets positive yards. Chris? Anish, for as much as Coach Strong has said this team rallies around McLeod, I thought it was interesting after the second interception, he just moping around on the sidelines not one of his teammates came up to him to offer any kind of encouragement i talked to mcleod during the week and he was excited about being able to be more vocal with this team which i saw after the first series but since then has been silent and so is this offense there's the blitz mcleod has time completes to perlet at the 40 for a first down that ball took a while to get there. If it gets there a little quicker, that could have been a bigger game. I'm disappointed. It took a while for the teammates to come lift him up. That speaks directly to the leadership of the Bulls team because you've got a young quarterback. You see how good he can be. And, yes, he comes down, he throws two costly interceptions, but the reality of it is, is he's your guy. And I think Charlie Strong is going to stick with him. They're going to stick this one out, so you better make sure he's motivated. Sands gets the call on first down for a pickup of four. McLeod, a local kid, Plant High School, right here in Tampa. Brother Ray Ray played for Clemson, a wide receiver, now with the Carolina Panthers. Only his second career start. Against the three-man rush, McLeod down the seam. Incomplete, he wanted Perlette. Wow, I, I'm, I'm disappointed here in the SMU defense. They only rushed three. How in the world does somebody get behind you in coverage that wide open? And McLeod, who doesn't have necessarily a strong arm, just overthrows the wide receiver. But I mean, he had time here. Great pocket, three-man rush, as you see. And those two safeties, I'm not sure what they were doing, but it, somebody has to be a safety net there because they were beat on the play and had McLeod put that ball on the money, uh, USF's fight song would be playing. What should they have been doing? Well, I, I don't know. It, it appears as though they both came down. I'm not what sure they came down for. Maybe they were underneath routes that they bid on, but um, something that can't happen. Third down now. Four-man rush. McLeod. Pocket collapses, and down he goes. Terrence Newman gets the sack, and it's fourth down and another empty drive for the Bulls. I'm telling you, no, that, that guy likes to eat quarterbacks. He also likes to eat. I mean, he's, he's sitting there at 315, 5'11". I mean, you talk about a stump. In the middle of this line, there is no way you move this kid. And you saw him, just a powerful, strong athlete. And, you know, an SMU didn't, they didn't used to have athletes like this. No, despite his, his stature and being small, I mean, he's a bull in the middle. And that time there just pushes the line of scrimmage back right into the quarterback's face. Schneider to punt. Crochet back deep. And this one bounces at the 39, and it goes out of bounds. The Charlie Strong era started strong, 17 and two, just one and eight since, and the gravity of discontent grows on that bull sideline.
Shane Bouchel, son of former big leaguer Steve Bouchel, is pitching a perfect game. Dad didn't pitch. He was an infielder. But Shane is 10 for 10, 126 <laughs> like yards. And doing it against his old coach, Charlie Strong. Those two teamed up in 2016 at Texas. Strong's final season in Austin. Bouchel will throw on first down. That's complete to Rice, who's across midfield. A gain of... 10 and let's call it a first down. And this offense right now, it, it, they're just rolling. They're, they're in a great rhythm and calling the right plays. Galliard, again, great downfield blocking. That time it was Granson providing the block to spring Galliard for extra yards. Those bubble screens, those tunnel screens, the blocking sells it. Yeah. TJ McDaniel. He's to the 40, third and one. And, and to that point, to be able to get the ball to the perimeter that quickly, you've got to be, Shane Bouchel, his background is baseball. And his, his arm slots, the release points, the things that he does with the ball so quickly, the coaching staff said it's almost like him turning two as there's an injured man down on the field for the Bulls. Greg Reeves just went down as a South Florida player was trying to leave the field. You never want to speculate, but you saw a South Florida player leaving the field and Greg Reeves went down. We never want to be the ones to speculate about an injury, but watch 51 trying to run off the field. That's Stacy Kirby, Greg Reeves number four, goes down. An injury timeout was called. It was third and short. You can make that call at home however you see fit. Reeves now on the sideline. Bouchel will hand it off. That's Cayman Freeman, and a first down at the 30. That was an explosive cut. <laughs> he just put his foot in the ground and, and got north and south. Outstanding run from Freeman. South Florida late getting set up. Bouchel, time in the pocket. Floats it downfield for Robertson. Robertson end zone! Touchdown, SMU! Sonny Dykes told us when Cal played Texas in 2016, he was impressed by Shane Bouchel's ability to throw the deep ball. And when they looked at what they needed at the quarterback position this year, they said, we knew we had a great downfield threat in Robertson. Who do you pair him with? They thought Bouchel would be the perfect complement. It worked. That's a beautiful ball. <laughs> I mean, it, and it just, it, it surprises me when you, when you look at it and, um, you know, Charlie Strong also knew that this was going to be um, a problem for them. You know, the Bulls have given up big plays through the air, and Bouchel is the last man you want to see who's been one of the best in the country at throwing the deep ball this season. PAT is good, so special teams even firing on all cylinders for SMU. They had missed five extra points coming into today. Bouchel. Three completions for 20 or more yards today. 23 on the season. 13 for 13. Yeah, and I, I know Bulls fans are saying, but, but if Mike Hampton would have, you know, secured that interception, he wouldn't be. But one thing for sure, even going back to last week in the fourth quarter of the TCU game, he dropped a 38-yard dime downfield that ended up setting up the game-winning uh, field goal. But it was a three-man rush, wasn't a lot of pressure, and he just threw the ball perfect in the perfect location. And when you look at his pass, you know, they, they talk about the weight of the ball. Oftentimes, you have guys with a big, strong arm that'll throw it, right? And it's hard to catch. His ball is so catchable. It just, I mean, it almost just like lays in there like a loaf of bread. And you see the wide receivers, very easy for them to run through the catch. And uh, Bouchel is, he's off to a fantastic start. But this is something that you've seen throughout his career that he's been exceptional at. What's different about him now than when he was at Texas? Well, it's his ability. Uh, to, to be mobile in the pocket, to be patient as a passer, and I think also his running threat. I mean, I don't think anybody at the University of Texas would have confused him with a runner. Uh, he averaged uh, right at around one yard a carry uh, there at, while his time on 40 acres. He comes here, he's averaging 3.3, and we've seen him today even make some plays with his feet. That's been the major difference for Michelle. A line drive kick, and South Florida will take it to about the 33. We mentioned that game between Cal and Texas when Bouchelle was a freshman. 2016, that's when Sonny Dykes was really impressed. And Dykes at the time had a future pro in Davis Webb at quarterback. He had just had 
Jared Goff. Bouchelle's numbers, yeah, they don't wow you in that game, but the deep ball did wow Dykes, and he filed that in his back pocket. Arlington kid coming back home to the Metroplex. It didn't work out in Texas that freshman season. Started 12 games. They had beaten Notre Dame to open the season, then lost that game to Cal, actually. And that would be Charlie Strong's final season in Austin. McLeod looking for Ford. Incomplete. Covered well by Brandon Stevens. Ahmad, I know you love Stevens' story. Running back all the way throughout high school. Running back at UCLA. Wanted a fresh start. Came to SMU. The coaches said, can you play cornerback? And he essentially had to earn his scholarship. Got to try out first practice. Defensive coordinator Kevin Kane says, who had that PBU? It's Stevens. He's now a starting DB playing this position for the first time in his life. He plays with great confidence, too. And uh, yeah, I, I like what he's bringing to the table. McLeod taken down in the backfield. Shane Haley. Chris? Keep an eye on McLeod's throwing wrist. In between series, he was looking at it, wincing, holding, rolling it. You could tell having some pain in the throwing wrist. That is just more injury to insult right now for South Florida, already down 28-0. McLeod has thrown two interceptions today. SMU showing pressure. And I think it's coming here. Their DBs are locked up in press coverage on the outside edge. Goal rush three. Incomplete intended for Eddie McDoom. And it's fourth down. That's a great disguise there from the Mustang defense. Uh, they went to that sugar look. And the sugar look means they normally, you'll line up six, seven, eight guys on the line of scrimmage. And you force the offensive line to decide who's coming as a rusher. But you also put the quarterback in a bad spot because he's thinking, is the pressure coming? That time there, they show the look, back out, and a wonderful uh, play for the defense as McLeod misfires. Prochet from the 36. Ankle tackled at the 47. Week four, Monday Night Football. Bengals Steelers in the Steel City. 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on ESPN. I cannot wait for Sunday NFL Countdown this week with some help from Uncle Rico of Napoleon Dynamite fame. <laughs> it's the story of how Minshew Mania has followed the rookie quarterback from Wazoo to Jacksonville. Great story. Imagine if Coach had put in Uncle Rico in the fourth quarter. <laughs> State champions. <laughs> That's a great story. I hope there's a segment where they try to throw a football <laughs> over a mountain. Oh, boy. <laughs> now, Shane Bouchelle has done everything but that today. A couple of TD passes. He has not thrown an incompletion. And a timeout by Charlie Strong. South Florida, their second of the half. It'll be a 30-second timeout. And I tell you what, after going three and out on that first series, they have scored a touchdown. <laughs> in every drive after that. Um, two actually came off of the interception, so 14 points off of the takeaways for this defense. And the, and, and the yardage, I mean, you look at 62 yards on the f first drive, 80, 80, 59. They're doing it, they're driving the football, they're doing a nice job right now, mixing it up with the run and the pass, and have totally worn down this defense for the Bulls, and, and I believe totally stripped them of their confidence and their ability to be able to stop uh, the Mustangs. Shane Bouchelle is 13 of 13, the school record for consecutive completions, 19. That a boy. You know, I saw him there, just the pocket mobility that I described to even get that ball off. Now he's on the move. Another excellent thrown ball, and, and then the big time throw here, right on the money, as Robertson hauls in the touchdown. Greg Reeves, who went down on the last drive when a player was trying to get off the field, is back in. Meanwhile, Jones making everybody miss. And another big game for him. 24 yards for Xavier Jones. Already over 100 yards in this first half. Well, this is what happens. Now they're just taking what they want now. Now the tempo. Michelle pumps. Downfield for Sanders. Incomplete. And we get a flag on the plate. It hit Hampton, who never turned around to play the ball. Yeah, and that's unfortunate because the ball was underthrown. Pass interference, defense number seven. 15-yard penalty, automatic first down. 
he's in prime position. And he's got to try to close that gap there. And that's what happened. Because the ball was underthrown to Sanders, he bumps the wide receiver before the ball gets there. It's the right call to make, but just unfortunate. And um, Hampton, I know he's thinking, you know, the junior right here from Tampa had an opportunity to get an interception, giving up some big plays today, trying to find his mojo back on the edge. Jones. Lost the football. South Florida says they have it, and they do. 12th takeaway of the season for the Bulls. They had eight in the win against South Carolina State two weeks ago, and boy, this South Florida sideline needed that. Yeah, they did. And a poor ball security for the Mustangs. As we talked about, they've scored their last four scoring drives. And just trying to make that cut back, the ball gets away from the body. And South Florida with a key turnover inside of the red zone. Twenty-eight nothing SMU. A couple of rushing touchdowns by Xavier Jones. A receiving touchdown by Proche and a Robertson. That last play under review. They're checking to see if Jones's knee was down before the ball comes out. And right there, uh, the knee is down. Is the ball out? No, I think this comes back. The ruling on the field was fumble, so you need indisputable video evidence. And right there, that left knee is clearly down. Then the ball comes out. Boy, USF cannot catch a break today. <laughs> no, they can't. This, this is, this is going to be the Mustangs' ball. And... Uh, you know, just this is one of those plays that just totally demoralizes a team, especially a young team for the Bulls. You, you know, it's just been coming all downhill, and now all of a sudden you feel like you make a play as uh, it, it looks like this play will be overturned, and I think rightfully so. Uh, it appears though Jones and Neva down, and now if you're the Bulls, just come back out and keep fighting. Bo, you're back here. Now you're, now you're playing for pride in each because with 28 nothing score and 7 minutes and 47 seconds to go in this thing in the first half, now you're just playing for pride. You're calling Sharpie this early? Uh, I mean, it's hard not to the way that the Mustangs are rolling downfield and, and the inability right now of the Bulls to be able to stop what they're doing and then not score points. So the gap's only going to increase if the game continues at this pace. Tell you what, on the flip side for SMU, they have not won 10 games in a season since 1984. ESPN's Football Power Index, the FPI, has SMU as a favorite in all but one game the rest of the way. And both teams are coming out and the officials aren't even <laughs> done. Both the offense for SMU and the defense for the Bulls. And, and the, the, the official is still looking at the play. It's still under review. Now that knee looked to clearly be After down. After further review, the runner's left knee was down. It'd be SMU's ball at the 14-yard line, second down. I'm not really sure what took so long. Maybe they were trying to get the spot correct, but wow. Well, here it is. Now you got SMU second down. The one thing that the Bulls haven't been able to handle is the pace of play. And uh, now when you've got these one-on-one -on -one matchups, no high safety, look for Bouchel to go back to the outside edges in the perimeter with his wide receiver. And now the center, Alana Lee, falls backwards. We get a flag. Snap infraction. Offense, number 77. Five-yard penalty, second down. Now, last year for SMU, they got off to a slow start, 0-3. Then had to, to battle through a lot of injuries. Ben Hicks, the quarterback, who nearly led a comeback against yeah. Texas A&M today for Arkansas. He saw his job get pulled out from under him, did regain it eventually. Bouchelle has offered a lot of stability. And Prochet has helped. That's the best wide receiver in the American Conference. He's got his second touchdown reception of the day. And right now, SMU's offense is typing in caps lock. Oh my goodness. I mean, another dime there from Bouchel, but these short-handed wide receivers are making them pay in coverage. And this is just a will route. You know, so he pretends that he's going out and he comes back up and it's good coverage there from Vincent Davis for the Bulls, but the ball and the catch were just better as now we're looking at a 35-0 score with an extra point.
missed the PAT. Sixth missed extra point this season for SMU. That was Roberts on the PAT attempt. He's been the kicker today. We thought we might see Kevin Robledo, who was the kicker and a pretty good one last year, and Robledo's been bothered by a groin injury. That's one area they have to get right, whether it's Robledo getting healthy or if he's not going to get healthy because, now listen, we've watched enough college football. At some point, you're going to have a game or two that's going to come down to special teams and the kicking game. Uh, I mean, Alabama, you can't poke too many holes in the tide over the years, but how many times have we seen them lose a game and when they do, it's because of a kicker? You're right, and for specialists, especially for place kickers, and, and punters, you can get in your own head. And once you're there, it is hard to get out. And so I think for a lot of them, you know, I try to make this kid laugh or relax or something because the reality of it is this is not a good thing. And those should be easy points. Those are points that as a coach, you're not looking to really struggle on. And Sonny Dyke said it yesterday. I, I really don't have an answer. I mean, you know, he's but this is the worst thing that's happened to SMU today is them missing an extra point because everything else has gone pretty much as planned and better than I think anyone um, that's been covering this game expected. I did not expect it to be 34 nothing with seven minutes and 30 seconds remaining in the second quarter. Evans from the six. Across the 25 and stumbles across the 30. A nice return for Jaquez Evans for every field goal and extra point made by participating universities. Allstate will make a contribution to the university's general scholarship fund. Thank you, Allstate. So we missed an opportunity for an Allstate Indeed. contribution Indeed. on that last SMU touchdown. But really, that's the only hole you can poke offensively right. and defensively and on special teams for the Mustangs in this first half. They've <laughs> been sublime otherwise. Cloud standing in, incomplete intended for Ford. Now right now, this USF offense doesn't have any rhythm. Chris told you earlier that McLeod was looking at his wrist. Their best drive, a 16-play, 77-yard march, ended with an interception in the end zone. Ford in motion. Cloud in the pocket. Sideline off the mark intended for St. Felix and another third and long. Curran Bell told us yesterday, I asked him, I said, what are some of the areas of improvement that this young man could make? And he talked about his footwork and, and for him not having played the position. And I think a lot of people don't understand that, you know, especially young players, they try to throw the ball with their arm. But for big time quarterbacks, you know, you've got to throw it with your feet. And if your feet aren't set in the proper position, it's hard to make these throws. It's hard to go to your backside. It's hard to get into your throws downfield. And that's something they're working with this young man. McLeod under pressure and sacked. Delonte Scott, his third sack of the season. It's fourth down. That scenario where SMU has dominated today and we thought it could be problematic. You have an offensive line which has struggled in protection against a D-line that can get after the quarterback. Yeah, and Scott, he's got a lot of these on film. Nice job of, of going upfield, forcing McLeod to go inside of the pocket, but falling back. Great hand placement to get away from um, the offensive line, and, and he's rewarded with a sack. Schneider punts it away. Prochet from the 30. Little shake and bake. And about a 10-yard return. Tonight, Ohio State and Nebraska. We do have a flag. Buckeyes have won four straight against the Huskers. Personal foul. Unnecessary roughness. Receiving team, number 30. 15-yard penalty on first down. They'll get Tyler Levine. Yeah, just right uncalled in front for. of the umpire. Yeah, and uncalled for. Trying to get that low-bearing fruit, but 
He wasn't even involved in the play. 34 nothing SMU still six and a half minutes to go in the first half. TJ McDaniel sheds the initial tackle and gets to the 30 yard line. Good looking freshman running back his brother Cam played running back and was a captain at Notre Dame. And TJ had a number of power five offers including Clemson and Oregon. Bouchelle will keep it and nose dives ahead uh, about a half yard shy of the marker third and one I like that I like that decision keep the defense on honest hold those defensive ends as long as you can again using tempo McDaniel stood up Kevin Kegler was the roadblock and it's fourth down and we have not seen many stops from USF in fact we have not seen a single stop since the opening drive for SMU. You're right, as the punter finally makes his way out to the field, and sometimes that's what that happens with that pace, right? The Bulls were able to determine what was coming. They pressed the line of scrimmage and caught the Mustangs off guard. Trevor Denbo, a rugby-style kicker who's also the starting safety, will punt for SMU. He punted four times in the win against TCU, and that's a 42-yard kick. And Ashraf, Fahmad Brooks, Chris Budden with you. Raymond James Stadium in Tampa. USF down 34-0. This offense against FBS competition. They played Wisconsin. They were shut out. Played a rebuilding Georgia Tech team that is totally overhauling its system. They only scored one touchdown in that game, and so far nothing in the first half against SMU. And a penalty. Start. Offense, number 77. Five-yard penalty, first down. That's the right tackle, Marcus Norman. They really challenged that right side of the offensive line during the bye week. Norman and Atterbury, they felt those guys could play better. Those are the seniors, the veterans on that O-line. Yeah. The Sands will set up the second and long. Trayvon Sands, senior from Miami, criminology major. Perhaps Miami Metro has an opening. Dexter still maybe out there. Cloud, nowhere to go, and he's sacked. Nelson Paul, and that is four sacks for SMU, which had 15 on the season entering play, and they've done a nice job of keeping McLeod in the pocket. They've done a terrific job. I mean, their angles have been outstanding. This time here, just fighting off the block there from the tailback. And when you force them to go inside, you're more likely to contain a dynamic runner like McLeod and give this defense credit. Uh, they know that his strength at this point in his career are, is his ability to buy time in, in his feet. Here's Ford. He's terrific in space, but there was no space. No gain. It's fourth down. And another loss to drive for USF. Yeah, and Clemens already has two interceptions on the day, but this time, I mean, he just turns into a ball on the back end and forces the block right into uh, the wide receiver trying to run that screen. As you said, there was no space there. And uh, this defense with some outstanding plays as they continue to uh, crush the Bulls. C.J. Sanders, five return touchdowns in his career, waits at the 40. Schneider, good kick. Sanders from the 35, and he's blown up as soon as he makes the catch, a 44-yard punt. And at some point, you, you, you begin, you start to wonder, what, what are you going to do with Bouchelle? I mean, um, their backup, their original backup, William Brown, number nine, is, is not suited up today. And um, apparently, maybe a little banged up from this week's practice. And so now you're, you're forced to Terrence Gibson, the freshman from Houston, Westfield, 
who could see some minutes in this ball game. Just hand it to Xavier Jones. That's worth <laughs> He's having a career day today. He's got about 150 yards in this first half. I think that number's skewed. They may have given him credit for a rush on a reception, but still, he's well over 100 yards, That's and he's got two it. TDs. Yeah. Jones to the sideline, McDaniel into the game. Jones goes down on that play, and it's been tended to right now, Pierce. TJ McDaniel. There's the patience from the young freshman, Chris. Well, Jones is a guy you root for after last year coming, trying to come back too early after an MCL sprain would come back, re-injure it. Instead, throughout it all, he fell into a really dark place, some depression. He says his family is the one that helped get him out of it. Bouchelle tucks it and runs. He's tripped up out of bounds near midfield. Mikaela Point, sophomore out of Sefner, Florida, with the tackle. Third down. Jones there on the sideline, and this will be good for McDaniel to get some reps, and Bouchelle there once again just really showing how, how good he can be as Jones is listed for 15 carries, 155 yards. That's over 10 yards to carry. Uh, I'd say that's a good day. Came in as the AAC's leading rusher. There's the blitz. Bouchelle has to throw it away, and that is the first incompletion he's thrown today. Darius Slade, one of four Power 5 transfers on this defense applying the pressure. And now you start to wonder because the hit he takes here from Slade. This is a grown man now. Slade, this kid can go. I think he's one of the more draftable prospects in the, in the game today. I mean, he just gets at 6'5", 257 from Montclair, New Jersey. And he up ends Bouchelle there. And, and, and if you're Sonny Dykes and you're up at this margin, I know it, you often will allow your starter to play through the half, but this game is so out of hand right now, I think you might start wondering, are the backups on their way, and just run the football. This one punted out of bounds by Denbo. 34-0, SMU had a big win against TCU last week, and Sonny Dykes wondered how his team would come out. Now, they answered that question with emphasis. At halftime, Kevin Connors and the crew will get you caught up. Clemson and North Carolina in a battle. Mac Brown, can he score a big upset against the defending champions? The Tide rolling against Ole Miss. And you're a quarterback. Why wouldn't you want to play for Lincoln Riley? Jalen Hurts continues to put up big numbers. Had another great afternoon against Texas Tech today. Ford in the backfield and now split wide. Flair to Ford. Clemens meets him in the backfield and drives him out of bounds. Johnny Ford excels in space, and SMU has taken away space from this offense today. I love the way this young man tackles. I, I like his aggressiveness. I like his approach, his awareness. That time there just doing a nice job of scraping off of the other SMU defender and putting himself in a prime position to make a play with already two interceptions on the day. We've seen him do some fine things back there at the safety position. The young man from Katy showing out. Second and long. McLeod under pressure again, and he can't get away. The fifth sack by this SMU defense. They have been relentless. Pono Davis, the Pono Express. Timeout. The first to get there. SMU, their first and a half. It'll be a 30-second timeout. He's the leader on that SMU defense, 51 and white. Transferred from Tyler Junior College in Tyler, Texas. The home of Tyler Rose, Earl Campbell. For Jordan McLeod, this has been a welcome to the big leagues moment. Yeah. First conference game, first start against an FBS school and against a pretty good defense in SMU. Yeah, this was after a long drive. He gives one up to Rodney Clemens. Great job by Clemens. This one was just a poorly thrown ball. And then he comes back here, they're in the RPO package, nothing to the play side, tries to look back, defense snuggles him. And it's been all day, but they've done a good job of trapping him in space. And, and at the, after that last play, he was slow to get up. You start to wonder, when do you go to, you know, the senior Blake Barnett? How about now? I, I, I don't know, this is a tough decision for me because, you know, we asked Charlie as a crew, we said, 
is this your guy? He said, yes. And he addressed it all week in the media. And I think right now, you, 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 you take away his confidence if you take him out, and you can take away his confidence if you leave him in the way that he's playing. So this is a very difficult decision to make. On third and long, McLeod under duress. Sacked again, Demrick Gary this time. Six first half sacks. Ahmad, here's the, here's the thing though, if you make the move, just two weeks after you made the change, it screams panic. And the optics of it don't look good. And uh, again, what was Charlie Strong's big bugaboo at Texas? The big criticism, the way they handled the quarterback position. Yeah, this is a tough one. I mean, because I, I, like I said, I, I, I like McLeod, and I think this kid has a bright future. I really do. However, when it comes down to it, now you look at, at Barnett, who's there on the sideline. I, I, maybe you need a, you know, maybe you need the same type of boost that you thought McLeod provided to you two weeks ago, or three weeks ago. Pardon me. So now it's a tough decision, and, and for Charlie Strong, he, he and his staff and Kerwin Bell, they're going to have to make it. And they were very clear. Now, they didn't want to get into a rotating quarterback situation. Sanders fielding the punt back inside his own 25. Good kick that time, 61 yards. And SMU with the ball, 55 seconds to go. In a first half, dominated by the Mustangs. A penalty marker down on the field back at the six-yard line of South Florida. Run right into the kicker. Receiving team number 41. That penalty is declined. Result of the play will be first down. It was running into the kicker, not roughing, so it's not an automatic first down. But yeah, to revisit the point we were talking about. That's a good call. By in the fish. context of just this game, I think you can easily justify bringing in Blake Barnett. But in the bigger scheme, the optics of it, it's a no, it's a it's a lose-lose situation for Charlie Strong. Yeah, and, and I think and also for McLeod, because now you, now you think, well, do, do the coaches and this team have confidence in me? And, look, I, I, I like what I saw from the kid, uh, you know, in, in his first start, and I have liked the spark that he has provided this team. I, I do think he has a, a future here at the quarterback position. Bouchelle to Galliard, setting up the tunnel screen, and Galliard to Tornadoes across the 30 to the 35, a gain of a dozen that will momentarily stop the clock. SMU has one timeout. They have issues in the kicking game, so they're going to have to get close for a field goal attempt. Bouchelle underneath. Out of bounds. That's TJ McDaniel. Flag at the end of the play. And that might be a face mask. I would agree. Personal foul. Face mask. Defense number 41. 15 yards. Automatic first down. They get Bellamy in, and now you tack on 15 yards at the end of the play. Protecting the quarterback. Penalties. Aaron throws defensive miscues. It has been just a calamity of errors in the first 30 minutes for the Bulls. That's the seventh penalty, and they, they've been a team that's been penalty riddled already this in the season. That average has to be cleaned up. Eight a game. Bouchelle off the hands of McDaniel. 26 seconds to go. That's a nice check down. You know, and at McDan McDaniel thought he had pressure behind him, but there was no one. He could have he could have picked up an, an extra 15, 20 yards behind him. Bouchelle seeing that everybody had dropped back deep in coverage and checks it down. McDaniel on the swing pass. Broke the initial tackle, picks up positive yards, only two, boils the stop. And a timeout by SMU. 17 seconds to go in the half. No timeouts now for the Mustangs. And I think people may be wondering, well, what are you calling the timeout for here? Listen, when you get an opportunity to execute two minute, you have to. It doesn't matter what point or how much you're up in a ball game, especially going into half, because for quarterbacks, for offenses, you've got to execute this. If you can get points out of this, they may need those down the road. And I, I think right now, I mean, you start to look at it. Well, who is some of the competition in the American? And yeah, you, you're, you got that team, Central Florida, yeah, that is, listen, 
they're legit and you're gonna have to score points. It may come down to a field goal. It may come to it may come down to three or four points if if that plays out and, and they're able to continue this train that they're on, then you know what's staring you in the face. Everybody in Dallas would love to see SMU and UCF because the only way it could happen would be in a conference championship. <laughs> Indeed. Memphis is going to offer resistance when these two teams play. You're right. But from what we've seen, and we have a pretty good sample size now, the TCU win was telling last week. Yep. This SMU team, it has a chance to have a special season as Granson jumped. Ball start. Offense, number 83. Five-yard penalty, third down. Kylan Granson, transfer from Rice. The schedule certainly sets up for SMU. No UCF, no Cincinnati in the regular season. And they've already banked a huge win against TCU. Non-conference win, but still big. Bouchelle, downfield, wants Prochet, that's intercepted. Devin Studstill, the Notre Dame transfer. And he's taken down in SMU territory, a 37-yard return, and there's still five seconds left in this opening half. Yeah, he took a shot, and stud still, I, he stands out to me also on film, and he makes really good decisions. He's very comfortable in the middle of the field, does a nice job of playing the game with the quarterback, but that was just an outstanding angle, and, and managed to get around him. What an athletic play to get around the wide receiver, still managed to catch the ball with his hands, and then run after the catch of Devin Stud still. As you mentioned it, coming from Notre Dame, uh, I think this is, a, this is a young man that will have an opportunity um, as he's a graduate transfer to play at the next level. Charlie Strong recruited him out of high school. One last chance for SMU, or rather USF. McLeod will try to throw it as far as he can, or nope, check down. And Cronkwright gets out of bounds, but the half is over. What does Charlie Strong say to his Bulls? For Sonny Dykes, there's a lot to like. SMU opening up a can in the first 30 minutes. You're watching ESPN College Football presented by Sling TV. And he's Shroff, Ahmad Brooks, Chris Budden with you in Tampa, SMU. Off to its best start since 1984. I don't know if Big Brother is watching, but the rest of college football needs to start paying attention to the Mustangs. This is a team that can make considerable noise in the group of five, and their first half was a complete demolition of South Florida. The Bulls will receive the second half kickoff. it at the five and four taken down at the 22. An ace round for Bob Brooks. Today's mayhem moment is brought to you by Allstate. Uh, where do you want to pick? I mean SMU had about six or seven mayhem moments in that first half. Yeah I think this is more about the Mustangs than it is about the Bulls. This team is for real and offensively right now they're clicking on all cylinders. Bouchelle with excellent pocket mobility and drops a dime to Porsche with the catch. And then you come back, Xavier Jones right up the middle, despite the box being packed for a touchdown, untouched. And then they come back, another big time ball from Bouchelle for a touchdown. And this offense is just flat out rolling. Blake Barnett in at quarterback to begin the second half, and he finds Johnny Ford for a big gain. Chris Budden, you just spoke to Charlie Strong. This is a surprise. I did. He told me we're going to stick with what we're doing, which was McLeod. So that obviously changed within the last 60 seconds. He was also not a man of many words, and we're getting our tails kicked and walked off. So obviously making the change. I, I think you can do both. I, I really do. I think you can put Barnett in the game and still start McLeod next week and just say, big fella, retire on this one. They get it to Ford. And in the first half, they couldn't get Johnny Ford as many touches as they would have liked. He returned the kick. They go to Ford on first down. They go to Ford again. That seems to be the game plan here. And he's a special dynamic player, and Barnett here um, has the better arm. I, I don't think anybody would argue that. And so they'll look for him to pass the football and to try to operate. 
Barnett started the first two games. Second year with South Florida. And he'll run out of bounds toward midfield. And that moves the chains. Blake Barnett, a few years ago, was Alabama's week one starter. That was 2016 when Shane Bruchel was starting for Texas. Jalen Hurts replaced him as the starter the very next week. Barnett eventually transferred it to Arizona State before finding a home in Tampa. They'll hand it off. Cronkreit with a gain of four. Barnett last year was also the king of comebacks for South Florida. Remember, they started 7-0 before losing their last six games a year ago, and in those seven wins, there was maybe some smoke and mirrors, but four times they were tied or trailing in the fourth quarter, and with Barnett at quarterback, they won all those games. Pono Davis to stop after the carry by Cronkreit. Because of all that movement, you know, the, the irony is that this young man has seen six different offensive coordinators yeah. throughout his career, and um, you know, it's got to be very difficult for him to be able to to learn the different verbiage and to be able to remember and lock in on one particular scheme. Third down, Barnett will throw incomplete. He wanted Wilcox the tight end. It's fourth down. Let's see if the offense stays on the field. I think they will. And to your point, Ahmad, when we talked to Kerwin Bell, first year offensive coordinator for USF, he said before the week one game against Wisconsin, Barnett told Bell, I feel as prepared as I've ever been for any game. And then once he got out on the field, he said, now all those past inputs were scrambling him. Those different lingos and different language from all those different offensive coordinators and playbooks. Let's go! On fourth down, Barnett will throw. Now he'll try to run. A flag is down. Barnett shy of the marker. Penalty marker down at the 47. USF football helmet down on the field on the offensive lineman. Brad Cecil, the center. He's gesturing that somebody ripped it off or hands to the face. We'll see. And if the penalty resulted in the helmet coming off, then Cecil can remain in the game. He doesn't have to come out for a play. The point. Personal foul, hands to the face. Defense, number 96. 15 yard penalty, automatic first down. Yeah, penalty on Zach Abercrombie, and so Cecil will not have to come out of the game because the penalty resulted in his helmet coming off. That's a break for the Bulls because uh, SMU bottled up Barnett in the backfield, really didn't have anywhere to throw downfield because of the outstanding deep coverage and was going to scramble and would, would have prevented him from getting the first down. Now a penalty um, leads to a fresh set of downs. Forward in the slot. Von Kreit in the backfield. Barnett again to the air. Steps up. Evading the pursuit. And finally taken down by Delano Robinson. A gain of about four. And Barnett's helmet comes off. And he will, by rule, have to come off the field for one play. Well, I think it came off with, with well, looked like it came off because he got tackled as McLeod is. It looks like some quarterback's coming in at 14 or something. Wow. If it's not a penalty, though, he does, by rule, have to come out for one play. South Florida can use a timeout. I don't know why you would right here. Jacquez Evans in the ballgame. Evans is in. We've seen him on kick returns. Snap over his head. Rolling back to the 40. Evans falls on it. Yeah, maybe they should have used that timeout. Wow. I mean, you just, if you just pan over the uh, USF sideline, it is ejected from this. Not a lot of movement, not a lot of energy, and, and Charlie Strong is going to have to really try to get this group back going next week. I mean, it looked like at the very least he had a scoring chance. Jordan McLeod on the sideline did not have his helmet to get ready. Was that the reason that Evans was put into the game? And it appears it was. That's a, a rookie mistake there by the redshirt freshman. So now third and long. Four-man rush. Barnett has time. Incomplete. He wanted forward, and it's fourth down. 
This drive sort of sums up the afternoon for South Florida, the nightmare of real things. You get a little bit of momentum. Barnett seemed to jumpstart the offense. You're getting the ball to Ford, and then his helmet comes off. Your starting quarterback today, McLeod, is not ready, so you bring in the number three QB, Evans. The ball is snapped over his head, and you got to punt it away. Schneider, the 29-year-old Australian, will punt. Crochet waits at his own 10-yard line. Fair catch is called for and made at the 16th. Another missed opportunity for South Florida. SMU will get its first chance of the second half. From Raymond James Stadium, you're watching the American Conference on ESPN. SMU with the ball for the first time in this second half. They dropped 34 in the opening 30 minutes. Running back Xavier Jones, 155 yards, two touchdowns. Charlie Strong saw another lost drive on that last South Florida possession as Shane Bouchel throws incomplete for Prouchet. Who's slinging it? Brought to you by Sling TV and Bouchel, the grad transfer from Texas, has been as sharp as Valerian Steel. And he's shown everything that he's shown on field prior to this point. Good decision making, excellent downfield throws, and poise. And he's the leader right now, not only of just this offense, but this entire team. And Sonny Dykes, he spoke to that. He said he's a guy that can relate to anybody. He's not just the offensive leader. And he's, he's just a junior, so he'll be back. Um, with the Mustangs uniform on next year, more than likely. The blitz, Prochet hauls it in at the 20. Rhett Lashley, the offensive coordinator for SMU, told us when SMU was in the market for a grad transfer, they wanted a leader. Yeah. And before Bouchelle even enrolled at SMU, while he was still taking classes at Texas, but had announced he'd come to Dallas, he'd visit up on weekends, and he would go to practice, be a fly on the wall, watch from the sidelines, and then spend the weekend. Third down. Jalen Thomas jumped. He would spend the weekend with the guys, hang out with them, get to know the players, his teammates. Then he gets to campus in June, and before the coaches can really work with the players, he's spending time developing chemistry with his receivers. He was elected a captain in the fall. He's an outstanding young man. My time of covering covering him there while he was at the University of Texas. Just did things the right way, has the right approach to, to, to being a student athlete. Three-man rush on third down. Bouchelle scrambling, chased by Reeves, finds McDaniel for a first down. T.J. McDaniel, the freshman, a gain of 24. Well, I said it at the top in the show, uh, this is the difference. And, and you, you may wonder, well, what has Bouchelle done that he didn't do at Texas? This right here. He throws across his body, takes his shot, and puts the ball on the money. Bouchel is playing big time football. And off to McDaniel. And he's taken down at the 40 yard line by Kirk Livingston. USF uses a defensive front that oftentimes does not feature a true defensive tackle. They go with three D ends and you sacrifice strength for speed. But sometimes that also makes you vulnerable against the run, especially inside. You're right. Daniel again using the stiff arm and taken down for a loss. It's third and ten. And this is where you'd like the young running back to stay north and south. And listen, his cutting ability is, is razor sharp. I mean, this is a young man that can get in and out of cuts, keep his, his speed um, and burst through the cut. But the older he gets, the more he'll understand, I've got to go north and south um, when it's necessary and know where the marker is. You don't want to have those negative plays. Bulls showing blitz here on third down. One high safety look. Prochet turns the corner. And James Prochet is going to be awfully close to the first down marker. About a yard shy. It's fourth down. And the offense appears that it will go for it. That's a great read here from Michelle. He knew that he was coming down. And let's see where Prochet goes out. Yeah, it's an excellent spot there. And if he keeps his feet there, he, he would have perhaps picked up that first down as now they bring in 
uh, more muscle. Uh, you would expect to see this be a quarterback sneak, some type of run right up the middle in the interior run game as the play clock is narrowing down. Maybe just take the delay here. That's what it appears in just, you know, this yardage here, and some people are like, well, what happens there? Moving them them five yards back, it, it really only helps the punter and his ability to be able to place one inside Four of the five foul. or whatever the case may be. You don't really use, lose a whole lot there. But they actually called the timeout. No, they moved it back, it appeared. Yeah, they did take the delay of the game, so now the punting team will come on. Denbo sails, short return after a 38-yard line drive punt. 34 zip, Mustangs. This week, USF hosted rape survivor and activist Brenda Tracy, whose platform set the expectation, strives to educate college and high school coaches and players on the culture surrounding sexual violence. It was the second time this year Tracy spoke with the USF football team. She visited the campus during fall camp as well to discuss her story of survival after being gang raped by four football players in 1998. Tracy set the expectation campaign, focuses on raising awareness through sports and signing a pledge in the name of fostering safer and more respectful cultures within athletics. There is Brenda Tracy. She was at NC State a week ago and has been going to different campuses, spreading that message this fall. Blake Barnett will throw on first down too high. Chris? There is a set the expectation game at least every month the rest of football season. I spoke with Brenda Tracy before the game. She says the response has been overwhelmingly positive. And the reason she chose to do this during football season was because the majority of sexual assault cases happen from when they step on campus to Thanksgiving break and they spike on home football games by 41 percent. Wow. Third and six for South Florida. Trevor Denbo, who's been handling double duty today, safety and punter, made that last tackle for SMU. Barnett over the middle, misfires. He wanted forward, it's fourth down. New offensive coordinator, new O-line coach for South Florida this year, and it's Kerwin Bell. When Sterling Gilbert left, Charlie Strong made the decision to hire Bell, who had a ton of success at Division II Valdosta State. But it's a different offensive system than what Sterling Gilbert had in place at South Florida. Yeah, very similar, as you see the list of coordinators for both Texas and South Florida, where you start off with a system where you want to run the football, and then you go to an open system. And, and, and that really affects the personnel. And CJ wow. Sanders is a threat on returns, five career return touchdowns, and he gets into plus territory. But to your point, that was the big knock on Charlie at Texas. There was a lack of offensive identity. It kept on changing. And, Everybody in college football and football knows what a great defensive coach he is. That offensive component just has not been consistent in his time as a head coach at Texas and now South Florida. Yeah, and, and I think some of the noise on the outside for people, uh, the fans, and, and both fan bases, you, you feel like there's this management struggle where you, you don't know at times where Charlie Strong is fit to be a coach or not. And I, th I think he had success at Louisville, and when you start to – as Galliard brings it to the 46. And, and as you start to stack up, you know, the, the, the things that he does well, we, we asked him, you know, even yesterday as a staff, like, how does he manage the team? And he said, I give full responsibility to my DC, my OC. I handle the players and things that relate to the players. And, you know, there are a lot of different systems, Anish, that work. At the end of the day, though, he wants to win championships. And they haven't been able to do that, despite having a really good team when he comes in here in year one. And so there's this outside noise, and you begin to question whether he's a good head coach or not, because to your point, 
he's been an outstanding defensive coordinator in his history as a, as a coach. And frankly, as the Mustangs pick up what appears to be another first down. Yeah, Merrick Pierce, the freshman, uh, or the senior running back in the game. I, I don't think that conversation stops. You know, today, they, you know, we, we talk about them playing great defense. They've been poor today defensively. Offensively, it looks like they're struggling to find answers. And now you're back into a quarterback controversy, despite him telling our own Chris Button that, listen, McLeod's our guy. And I do believe that he said that to McLeod. Hey, we're going to put you on the bench. Hadn't been your day. But now, what is the locker room thinking? Now, what is McLeod thinking? So, Charlie Strong has some management things that have kind of hung over his head in his last two stops. That's something that, if you're Charlie Strong, you've got to correct in a hurry. And Pierce with a three-yard gain. And what's the narrative going to be this week in the media? Absolutely. I know Charlie Strong may not care about that, but you live in Austin. You played at Texas. You had a first-hand look at what happened there. And... Do you see a little bit of history repeating? It, it is, and, and I think it comes with perhaps he didn't have a lot of talent to open up with at Texas and a bunch of entitled babies. Tyler Page sets up third down. Yeah, it didn't really have a lot of offensive talent to work with, and you bring in your offensive coordinator, you're trying to change the system, trying to also clean up the program as an injured bull down on the field. It appears to be 55. Timeout. Patrick Boy, Macon. An player. And... You know, I, we'll finish this on the other side of the break as Macon, we hope, is okay. Patrick Macon appears to be okay. Graduate transfer from Oklahoma State. It's third down for South Florida, or rather SMU. Shane Bouchelle still in there for the Mustangs. We were talking before we went to break just about Big picture worldview on this Bulls football program right now that has been in a tailspin since the middle of last year. Bouchel escaping the initial pressure. And Shane slides for a first down. They're going to get a flag at the end of the play. Stud still flew at the quarterback, who's a defenseless player, when going into the slide. Bouchel once again buying time on his feet. That's outstanding. And I think. You see that from Bouchelle? A little tap on the head for Stud still, knowing that there was no was malice, malice there. Yeah. It was a player looking right. to make a move, and the quarterback goes into a slide, yep. and now sometimes this becomes a foul, sometimes it's First a foul. Fit. See, half the distance to the goal, automatic first down. Yeah, no targeting there, but watch, watch the timing here in each of this slide. I mean, Bouchelle slides late. This is a difficult play here for a defender to make because you're already going into – your impact position, right? So now, uh, you know, and give Bouchelle credit. I, it was an excellent run. He did slide. And as you said, when he slides, he's a defenseless player. And uh, for if, if you're stud still, you have to continue to play with the aggression that he plays with and the aggressiveness because um, that's what's made him uh, one of the best in the American at doing what he does. Merrick Pierce into the game. He gets the call, fighting ahead to the 11-yard line, a gain of about three. Yeah, and to pick up the conversation with Charlie, I, you know, it, my thing is even in, in a situation like this where you've got a young ball club, what, how do they look when they come out of the locker room? What's your message to them? What are you saying? After a bye week. 100%. So you've had two weeks to prepare for one of the hottest teams in the country, and today it, it didn't appear as though um, that was an edge for you as you're still trying to look for some points, and the Mustangs have, you know, galloped all up and down the field. So... We'll see, and I think a lot of this is you have a young team, you know, and young players respond this way. Pierce brought down by Greg Reeves, a former walk-on. He was guaranteed a scholarship by Willie Taggart, and then Taggart left to take the Oregon job. Great story. Was left hanging in the wind, thought about leaving. The new coaching staff talked to him. They said, listen, we'll give you a chance to earn a scholarship. And he did just that, rising from sixth to first positionally on the depth chart. That's a great story, and, and it's a great story of perseverance, but it's also, this young man has done it right, and uh, defense coordinator Bron John Marie said, I, I, you know, normally I, I'll tell you, I, don't, I can't say there's not anything wrong with a player, but he said this guy just does things the right way, and it's, it's good to see him rewarded. He played middle linebacker last year when they had an injury. Bouchelle. Is he in? He is. And if I were Sonny Dykes, that'd be his last play. <laughs> I mean, what, what hasn't he done today? And, and 
I tell you, if you're a fan of the game or you're a fan of SMU or even if you're in the Dallas area, Texas area, believe me, these Mustangs are for real and it's because number seven has waited his turn. He sat behind Sam Ellinger a year ago after losing his job, didn't complain, was his greatest supporter. And now he's, he's been handed the keys to this Mustangs program and he's doing everything he can. But it's his feet, not his brains, not his arms that has made him so dangerous on the field. Once again, avoiding pressure, getting outside, and scoring a touchdown with his feet, something you'd have never seen in his freshman and sophomore season. Kevin Robledo attempting the PAT back after a two-game injury. Shane Bouchel with a smile as wide as the panhandle. And why not? The Mustangs rolling. Forty-one nothing SMU coming off a big win against TCU. Sonny Dykes wondered how his team would handle the added buzz and the budding national attention the Mustangs are receiving. Oh, they made believers out of all of us early. From the very first quarter, they have dominated this game thoroughly. A nine-play, 50-yard drive capped by a Shane Bouchel 10-yard touchdown run. Meanwhile, it has been Nothing but disarray on the South Florida sidelines today. They've already changed quarterbacks after making a QB change two weeks ago. Evans from the five. And taken down at the 25. Let's look at our Buick drive recap. And uh, Bouchel, he's made a difference. We started the show talking about his ability now to buy time. I mean, look at him there, just smooth, calm, and collected in the pocket. Picks up a first down with his feet, and then he comes back here. More pressure in his face. This time, still looking to throw the football, but squeezes in the end zone, protects the football. And I said it. He's been bad to the bone in 2019. He's been a rebel with his feet, not just his arm. We saw his outstanding ball placement today on his deep throws. One of the best quarterbacks in the country at throwing the ball downfield. But he's now really become a rushing threat. Keep in mind that this guy had only averaged one yard a carry at, at Texas during his time and now averaging well over three yards a carry, which is mighty Live fine for a quarterback. Offense, five-yard penalty, first down. And a penalty on South Florida. And a new rule went into effect a couple of years ago where after a kickoff, that play clock starts at 25, not 40. And right. Penalties continue to mount for the Bulls. It's been a problem all year. Barnett looking for Wilcox, who brings it in. Mitchell Wilcox, one of the best tight ends in the country. And Ahmad, I think you can sit here and say, why aren't we saying his name more? Why aren't they using him more? Well, let me tell you something. Barnett knows what kind of weapon he has. I mean, look at him here. That's a great route. I mean, it looks like a wide receiver. Created separation for sure on Richard McBride. And then makes an acrobatic catch behind him. Ooh. Kelly Joyner had some nice runs in the win against South Carolina State a few weeks ago. USF feels they have a power five talent in Joyner. Had a broken leg his senior year in high school. A lot of the bigger programs backed off. Charlie Strong coached his uncle, Tony, while at Florida. There's Johnny Ford. He's their best playmaker, reverses field. Ford skirts to the outside, gets a block from his QB, and picks up a first down. Oh my. He's got some wiggle. <laughs> I'm not going to say it, but there used to be a number 20. Oh, yeah. That did a little bit of that. I mean, this is just, listen, you can't, you can't coach this up. The ball was thrown a tad bit late. But I mean, he's like Houdini out there. Now you see me, now you don't. What? I mean, wow. Outstanding block. And even Barnett gets in on the blocking action, but. We knew it. They wanted to try to get him the ball, and you can see why this is a dynamic player indeed. 5'5", 180, lightning in a shot glass. Barnett completes to Mathis, using the tight ends on this drive, a gain of nine. That's a great catch there. And, uh, both of these tight ends are used very differently, but we talked about they're saying an incomplete catch. Now that's what the official is saying. He's ruling it an incomplete catch. Expect this to be reviewed. Unless you invoke the competitive effect rule where the replay officials can judge if you know, the game is past the point of 
being competitive, and you can make the argument that's the case here. They do not have to review every play then. I'd say. Now you called Sharpie early <laughs> in the second quarter. I, it just didn't look good, man. Yeah, and, no, you, know, you weren't wrong. And, and the reality of it is, is sometimes as a team, when things start going downhill, man, it's hard to stop. And when you have strong leaders, you can. You, you know, you can try to plug it up. But, you know, this is a team that's void of, of strong leadership because of their youthfulness. Barnett moves the pocket, throws on the run. He's got Mathis again, and Mathis reaching for the pylon. Touchdown. I wasn't sure initially if he got in, but the field judge ruled the touchdown. And again, if competitive effect is in play here, they may not review this. I think he got that in. That is a touchdown. Wow. It's the pylon. Jeez before he goes out of bounds. What an outstanding play from the young man right outside, right from right here in Tampa. The awareness too, jeez. Before play. he touches down out of bounds, he hits that pylon. And I tell you what also hit him was these tight ends in this drive and um, it was clear that Barnett went to him several times. It started with Wilcox, then he goes back to Mathis and they were really working the Mustang defense. Kobe Weiss. First score of the game for South Florida, just their second touchdown against FBS competition this season. And uh, Chris, I know Charlie Strong told you that Jordan McLeod is their guy. Blake Barnett has come out here in the second half and he's at least been able to move the ball offensively for South Florida. Is there a quarterback controversy here in Tampa, or do you expect McLeod to be the starter when they face UConn next time out? Yeah, I, I think for, you know, for me, I think you still stick with McLeod. Now, unless he comes out here and leads you to 28 points, maybe you, you make the competition going into next week, whoever practices better, but you, you've already, in my opinion, made McLeod your guy when you benched Barnett and he wasn't having, uh, you know, success early in the season. And Bell said it. He told our, he told our crew yesterday privately, he said, listen, it's, it's more than just Barnett. That, there was a lot going on. The offensive line wasn't blocking. They couldn't get creases. Guys were having silly penalties. The list goes on. But the reality of it is, is when you're the quarterback, you get the praise and you also get the blame. And he told Barnett that. And so as you see this, and he's old, he gets it. I'm sure he's had these lumps before and gone through the ups and downs of playing college football. C.J. Sanders dancing to the outside. He is dangerous on returns. And with another nice return for the Mustangs. Ohio State, Nebraska tonight at Lincoln. The Bus guys, Buckeyes have won the last four against the Cornhuskers, outscoring them 217 to 86. Ahmad, night game. At Nebraska, that oh. brings back some memories from your days when the Huskers were in the Big 12. It did, and uh, one of the one of the more memorable experiences I had as a, a freshman. We go into Lincoln, and we're able to beat them as we broke their 49-game win streak. And if you've never been to, down to Nebraska in Cornhusker country, that stadium is amazing. Those fans are incredible, and I look forward tonight for them to get a boost from that. And who knows, they may be able to keep this thing close and within striking distance. New quarterback for SMU, Terrence Gibson. His second game of the season, he, by the way, had an offer from Nebraska coming out of high school. South Florida finally got on the board in his third quarter, but Shane Bouchel and the Mustangs with a 41-7 lead. They have a chance to play as a ranked team at home next week. The last time SMU played as a ranked team, Bill Buckner had a grounder go through his legs. AP rankings brought to you by Capital One. Clemson just got a stop on a two-point conversion attempt by North Carolina. As Terrence Gibson runs for a first down for SMU. Gibson, the backup quarterback today. William Brown did not dress. Bama up big on Ole Miss. Ohio State at Nebraska tonight. Oklahoma continues to roll in. Wisconsin got a bit of a challenge from Northwestern today before hanging on. Notre Dame pulling away from Virginia. 
I thought SMU would be ranked after the win against TCU last week. I know South Florida is about to drop to one and three, and this doesn't help their case, but the way they've built on last week, to me, coming out with a dominating performance, it validates further what happened in Fort Worth a week ago, and I would expect SMU to be ranked. I think they should be ranked when they play Tulsa a week from today. Well, if you're, you're looking at the film, and, and you, you, it's hard not to see the, the talent that they have and um, a hungry ball team. To Eric Williams. And, and I think to your point, Anish, even the USF staff, they recognize it. They told us, they said, this doesn't look like your typical SMU team. I mean, they've got length. They're long, they're strong, they're big, they're fast. I mean, all the things that you associate with the top teams in the top conferences. And, um, you know, as you mentioned earlier, I think the schedule sets up perfectly for them. It looks like they've got leadership. And I really like Sonny Dykes after talking to him yesterday and being recruited by his father, Spike Dykes. I, I could tell you this much, that you start to get that feeling. You know, he's, he looks like the guy that you just want to be around the fire with telling crazy football stories. And, um, and I asked him, I said, what did you learn from your dad. He said, you know, to treat everybody the same. And right now, that is paying major dividends for him because he's getting big time recruits. Gibson can't get away. It's third down. SMU, since the death penalty, has not had a ton of success. They went to four straight bowl games with June Jones, but when they did, they didn't have a lot of in-state players. Yep. You live in Texas, and you know, people still kind of gave them some side eye. Yeah, you're winning, but right. you're not winning with Texans. Chad Morris, when he took the job and he came back to Texas where he had been a successful high yep. school coach, that was part of his M.O. I'm going to recruit the state of Texas. Sonny Dykes has built on that, but he's added a layer with the transfers. And you're seeing a good one today in Shane Bouchel. You see one in Reggie Robertson, who was here before Dykes took over. As Williams pinballs his way near midfield. The Texans and the transfers from the state of Texas inviting them back home this is now a program where guys are looking to go when they want to come back home. It's amazing to me. And, you know, and when, they, when they put Dallas across their chest a few weeks ago, it, they, were, they were really trying to, to secure the boundaries there in, in a very fertile recruiting ground. And I had guys that I played with at Texas retweeting the picture out that are from Dallas, like representing Dallas, you know, and it was a very unique thing to do. And I asked him about it, and he said, you know, that's the plan. We, we want to do that. And, so I think the fact that you, if you're Sonny Dykes and you're now opening your arms up to these guys that are having struggles and want to get back home, I think it's a great theory. But on the flip side, also Charlie Strong is doing the exact same thing here in the Florida area. So two programs really taking advantage of the transfer portal. Yeah, we'll talk more about the transfer portal, but you're looking at two schools today that stand to benefit from this new age in college football. ESPN, home of the college football playoff. Welcome back to Tampa. This transfer portal has become such a big deal at schools like SMU that Sonny Dykes has a meeting every day at 5 p.m. to discuss who has entered the transfer portal that day. They have one person that keeps track of it. On top of that, the whole idea with Dallas is that they hope they don't eventually have to get guys out of the portal, that the Dallas across the chest will change the perception of high school players wanting to come there. And guys like TJ Daniel, who was on a billboard, that one day they'll be able to say, I want to be on a billboard too over 114 <laughs> like TJ Daniel was and come straight to SMU, not have to go somewhere first and come straight to SMU. A nice run there by Blake Barnett. Chris, you live in Dallas. Do you get the sense that the branding is working of marketing SMU as Dallas's team? I do, and it's not actually just for recruits either. It's for the fans. When you think about that high school football stadiums sell out, the Cowboys sell out, for as much as that city loves football, why isn't the SMU stadium selling out? So it's not just about branding for the Dallas Independent School District and the high schools to want to come there, but also get the entire city rallying around a college so that Saturdays at SMU are an entire experience. And that man right there, Sonny Dyke, said it. He said at his time at TCU, he noticed that people that graduated from Texas and A&M were buying season tickets to TCU football games. And he said he wants uh, 
SMU to be the Dallas program that people want to watch, a fun style of football that wins games. Barnett fires it downfield, and he completes. Meanwhile, while we're talking about the transfer portal, a transfer here really doing a fine job of making some plays here for what looked to be a very dead bull football team. And there's Bryce Miller joined to the team as a walk-on last year, and he transferred from Southeastern wow. University. Flag down. 11.09 to go, fourth quarter. The Yalta Convention at the 27-yard line. <gasps> I... <laughs> oh, my guy, Anish. <laughs> oh, face mask, defense, half distance to the goal, automatic first down. And we're certainly looking at the backups in, in this ball game, and, and, and I think every coach will tell you, you know, you want them to gain this experience, but you also are looking for guys that make plays on both sides of the ball. For Charlie Strong, and he still has um, a few of his starting contributors out there, but primarily he also has backups. So you're just trying to see who's going to respond and make their play. Barnett against the blitz. End zone, touchdown, Bryce Miller. So Blake Barnett has come in here in the second half, and he's led USF to a couple of touchdown drives. And remember, there was one early where the Bulls were moving the ball downfield. Barnett had to come off the field because his helmet came off on the next play. The ball was snapped over Evans' head. He's looked sharp. And, and here's what, if you're watching at home, these, these are the backups for the Mustangs. Sure. So he's doing it, but he's doing exactly what he's supposed to be. I, the one thing I've been surprised with is his athleticism. I mean, despite his size, it's 6'5", 225. The kid moves very well, as that one's nearly blocked by the Mustangs. He's a mature young man, married, wife Maddie, a pro surfer, has a son, Brooks, and a touchdown pass here. Barnett to Bryce Miller. ESPN College Football is presented by Sling TV, the best of live TV, and get thousands of top shows and movies on demand. Those are real sharks. I actually found it very calm. It's very peaceful. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, our crew, we get a chance to do some really fun things, and you have to take advantage if you're in Tampa of the Tampa Bay Aquarium. Our buddy here, our niche, one of our leaders, he can't swim. So all week long, Chris and I were on him about it. And to your credit, Anish, you fought through for the team. Thank you. Chris, I how am, funny was that? I was so proud of Anish. He was so scared. He got up there and did it. But we were like in close proximity. I wish I just asked him if he had used the bathroom before we got in there. I swear, I should have brought adult diapers. That. <laughs> Those were real sharks. They put you in a tank. They submerge you. Chris is a certified lifeguard. There's me. I, I'm quite terrified to let go of the ledge. Look at the two Texans. We're just in it. We're going. We're not out. Only, not only can I not swim, again, there's real sea life. And you're swimming right by these sharks, and they're hitting up against your legs. And remember, I'm from Jersey. We're swimming with the fishes has a connotation. Anish, I tried to explain to you as a former lifeguard, oh I got goodness. you. If anything were to happen, I got you. Now, 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 Chris, I'm sure you are tough as nails. You've proven that. But it's a shark. I think it's oddly <laughs> relaxing and calming, to be quite honest. Oh, man. You know, they Maybe it's because I didn't want to move. I was afraid if I like kicked my legs at all, it would like distract the shark and they'd come right for you. The you know, Florida Aquarium. No, great folks was, there. Was Megan and Matthew and Wayne and Roger. Everybody there great. really made it a, a great experience. I, was I petrified? Absolutely. I'm just proud of you. For, for all the <laughs> pregame motivation that they gave us. Hey, these are lazy sharks. They're sand tiger sharks. They don't really bother you. Chris, you saw the teeth. Those were real shark teeth. They were real. And they swim with their mouths open. So like, there, was, there were eels too, stingrays. Oh boy. It's good but times. But they were lazy.
We're here. We're alive. <laughs> I kind of now know how the rest of the crew feels about me. Hey, let's throw the guy you can't swim in a shark tank. Okay. You did I'm great. I'm going to file that you one away. You did great, man. I was proud of you. And, 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 and I can swim, but I, there were a few times where, when you see this big sea turtle coming at you and, and it's snapping. and it, it, was, it was an unbelievable experience. And, and speaking of sharks, I think that's exactly what's happened here today. There was a hungry shark coming out of Dallas, Texas that has flat out um, devoured a bull. That was nice. <laughs> there goes the lead shark right there, Blue Shell. Well, third down here for SMU. Gibson standing in the pocket, escaping. He'll take off. And he beats Reeves and angles out of bounds, and he's got a first down. Nice run by Terrence Gibson, but hang on, there is a flag. Two. If I see another flag, I, oh my goodness. Personal foul, unnecessary roughness, defense number 55, 15-yard penalty, automatic first down. That, that's the 20th flag of the ball game, guys. I mean, 20th? Jeez. Perhaps some of the officials are auditioning. <laughs> Was it the, the Cecil B. DeMille line? I'm ready for my close-up. <laughs> We're officially off the rail. <laughs> oh, man. You look at the penalties. This is the third time South Florida has had at least nine penalties in a ball game. Mm -hmm. First down, Tyler Levine. Later tonight on ABC, Ohio State visits Nebraska. Night game at Memorial Stadium in Lincoln. Game day was there this morning. It should be a raucous atmosphere. Can Scott Frost get that marquee win for the Huskers? And will this Buckeye fright train continue to roll? Urban Meyer's gone. They've got a new quarterback in Justin Fields. Now this still looks to be a championship contender once again. Who are you taking? You always ask me. Ohio to State. You got Ohio, Ohio State. State. I think it's a lot closer than people are making it. And if the black shirts return tonight, look out, Justin Fields. I'm calling this game to come down to the fourth quarter and the Cornhuskers to make a return back to being a competitive program in the Big Ten. Nice moves by Tyler Page to get free down the sideline. Junior out of Friendswood, Texas, and more penalty markers fly upon Ahmad's request. Jeez. And this is just a silly play on the end of this. As uh, After the play, Bellamy. personal foul, unnecessary roughness, late hit out of bounds, defense number four. 15-yard penalty, automatic first down. That's on Greg Reeves, and now a man down at the 32-yard line for South Florida. Yeah, that, this is just on call for for Bellamy. He's clearly in the white as there's an injured bull down on the field as well, but um, just a silly mistake. And, you know, he's a freshman from Florida. As it appears to Devin Studstill down on the field. Will step aside, 7.51 to go in regulation. And Ashraf Ahmad Brooks, Chris Budden with you, SMU looking to put the ribbon and wrapping paper on what's about to be a 5-0 start. The Mustangs last started 5-0 in 1983. They have a chance to potentially play at home next week as a ranked team for the first time since 86. There's Levine, hammerheads forward to the 10-yard line. Now, I got the shark lingo in my head. <laughs> that was. I, whoa, that was vicious. I mean, he lowered his helmet and pads and ran through the defender. A little different than the pediatric baby shark <laughs> novellas that I've been reading of late. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Page lines up in the slot. Gibson in at quarterback. William Brown, the regular backup, not playing today. He did not dress. The give is to Levine. Third down coming up for SMU. You start talking about the best teams in the group of five. Certainly UCF is still in that conversation despite the loss to Pitt a week ago. Boise State, part of the Mountain West, which showed incredibly well in non-conference 
early in the season. Boise State currently the highest ranked group of five team. And you know, SMU pecking at the door, knocking at the door of the top 25. They received a lot of votes this past week. They were 28th if you want to drag the poll down a little further. But if this season continues on an upward trajectory, I think you can dream a little bit in Dallas in the Metroplex. Levine again. And it sets up first and goal at the one. Uh, they're, they're making noise. And, and this is a completely different team, in my opinion. And I think the way that Shane Bouchel is operating, some of the leaders that have emerged, and that they now have competition. And um, this is one of the best defenses. You, know, you and I talked about it all week long. We were watching film together. And in, in their history, you know, these, these guys are playing well. They're stopping the run. They're very aggressive on the outside edge. They're playing excellent bump and run coverage. They've got great athletes. And, and that was on display today. So we'll see when it's all said and done. But I think SMU is a true contender. Levine pushing forward. They'll be marked shy. SMU bringing in some size. Elijah Chapman, 93, a defensive tackle, came in to block. <laughs> this is always fun for the big boys. You know, you, you get an opportunity to finally hit somebody downhill and to block. But um, I've been impressed with what Levine's been able to do. He's, he's running behind his pads. And listen, he ha he's, he's, right now he's smelling the end zone. And if you're this Bulls defense, it's going to be hard to prevent him as he is probably going to get another carry here um, from getting in the end zone. And he's in the end zone. We do have a penalty marker. Are you kidding me right now? Touchdown by Levine, the PAT is good. Tyler Levine into the end zone. And the Mustangs continue to drive. Boomer and TJ are back with NFL primetime tomorrow, 7.30 Eastern, only on ESPN+. Plus. All the highlights and breakdowns from the day's games, updates after the Sunday night and Monday night games. SVP and Joe Tess will be part of the fun as well. Gorgeous setting sun, the diminishing daylight here of Tampa. And we've got 5-0-1 to play. SMU on its way to a 5-0 start. It's the purple haze of the Sunshine State. Roberts to kick it off after the touchdown by Levine, the first of Tyler Levine's career. Here's Johnny Ford. Ford taken down shy of the 20. Whoa, what a hit. Helmet popped off. He'll have to leave the field for at least a play. How about this? According to All-State Playoff Predictor, the American Conference has a better chance than the Pac-12 of getting a team into the college football playoff. Well, the way that um, UCF drummed Stanford, it, it makes sense to me. And if you're you're if you're marketing on something like that, then it's hard it's hard to argue with this. But and then I think with with how SMU continues to play, we'll see what happens if they can stay unbeaten and make their way to an undefeated battle between those two teams in the championship. You'd like to think that the committee is going to have to make a decision on whether this team can hang or not. Barnett finds Mathis, who has a touchdown catch today. Jordan McLeod started, struggled for South Florida, just his second career start, and Barnett has played the entire second half. But Charlie Strong told Chris Budden before the second half kickoff that McLeod is still the guy. Read into that what you will. Barnett will check down. Joiner spun down in plus territory. Chris? One of the things in watching McLeod this second half, he was still holding that right wrist. You could tell he's in some pain. So 
I didn't get a chance to ask Charlie if the move has been because of that or because of performance, but that's something we'll have to find out afterwards. Yeah. It could certainly be both. And you know, I think this is where we talked about it earlier, the management of the team, where Charlie Strong has a tough decision to make. And no doubt about it, the local media is going to ask. They asked him this week at his presser. They're going to ask him next week at his presser, who is the guy? And Charlie's going to also have to sell that to his team. When you have a quarterback controversy and, and a competition, uh, the players want to know who's going to be the guy that gets the first snap for our offense. Barnett rolling to his right. Downfield, and that's complete to Wilcox. A lot of the second stringers in there defensively for SMU. Now, Barnett has played against second string defensive players in the second half, but he was also the established starter going into the season. Nobody really thought South Florida would make a QB change. Not this early. Barnett was cemented and yeah, you just kind of figured he would be the guy this year, but lost his job after two games. Looking for Miller, incomplete. We get a flag. He was tangled up with Shevin Calloway. Yeah, clearly pass interference there. And, and I think what also made the decision a little more clear for Charlie Strong was that the offense didn't score. Pass interference, defense number 11. 15-yard penalty, automatic first down. Yeah, the offense didn't score for six quarters under Barnett. And... You were expecting this veteran to be able to stabilize a team, and because he had experience in multiple offenses, et cetera. And Barnett also said, he's on record as saying, this offense fits me. Fits him a lot better than the Sterling Gilbert offense, but still lack to produce touchdowns and points. And that makes it hard for a head coach when you've got a young freshman from the area um, who you feel like has some dynamic abilities to not only run the football, but make plays. And zone, Wilcox, touchdown. One thing for sure, he's carved up this defense with the tight end, and he has nailed them. And these guys have made themselves available. One thing that uh, McLeod wasn't able to do, and, and this is, look, Wilcox could start for most power five teams. I mean, <laughs> he's legit. This, this tight end is, is as good as they come in the country. He's got great ball skills. He can block. He can run. He runs routes. And, and, and he will be a guy that I think will play on Sundays. And, and Barnett came out to the, in the second half and really used him the way he should be. PAT by Weiss is good. And the skill set does not end there for Mitchell Wilcox. This past December, he was crowned the Gasparilla Bowl belly flop <laughs> champion. Pound the chest, it. Mitchell. Oh! <laughs> Even the Russian judge gives that a 10. He's the ping pong champion of the Bulls locker room. And I must add, the hair game is quite strong, too. And the beard. Oh, man. Good. So I talked to Wilcox this week about his phenomenal ping pong playing. And he said, I can beat everyone in that locker room. My only competition are the specialists, the kickers. He goes, why? <laughs> they got more time on their hands than everyone else. Just take it. He said, it's pretty, it's pretty intense. They stand 10 feet back from the table. They spike it. They use spin. <laughs> That's Forrest Gump ping pong. Yeah, yeah well, and you never, it never is too early or too late to take shots at the specialists. All the players that play on the opposite side of the ball are like, your schedule is so easy. And, that, and it gets even easier at the next level in the NFL where they literally will go golf during the day when the team is in the weight room. It, it's unbelievable. So I, I don't blame them for that. Golf. Yeah, no, seriously. They will play a round of golf during the day. <laughs> looks like the lineup for an onside kick. SMU not quite ready for it. Mustang still recover. It did not go 10 yards, so a flag is down. Well, penalties have been part of the story today. Offside, kicking team number two. Five-yard penalty, first down. Both teams with double-digit penalties. Look, one thing that stands out to me is, is we've talked a lot about this SMU offense and, and their ability to throw the football, but coming into this game, they averaged 216 rushing yards per game. And today, it's been no different. They have flat out did what they wanted to do. And on the opposite side, 
South Florida hasn't been able to, to stop the rush. You know, you go back to 2017, they led the conference in rushing yards, giving up only 126. Since that time, they were number 10 a season ago, and number 10 um, two seasons ago. So this has been a team that struggled to stop the run, and that's something they've got to get better at. SMU is averaging 5.4 poor play today. Derek Green is the new quarterback for SMU. Sports Center from L.A. tonight. After UCLA, Arizona, Stan and Neil have you covered. Herbie with his biggest takeaways from Week 5. Clemson got a huge scare from UNC, plus a deep dive into Ohio State, Nebraska, and Virginia and Notre Dame. No Deshaun Kaiser rescue needed by the Irish this time <laughs> against the Hoos, plus a title fight. Breakdowns from the ring and the octagon. C.J. Sanders getting the call. Sanders has a pretty good backstory, a child actor. Go to IMDb. He played young Ray Charles in the movie Ray. That's a great movie, too. Wow. Also has credits in Six Feet Under, Gray's Academy, Gray's Academy and Cold Case. And saved. His dad, Chris Sanders, played in the NFL, was at Ohio State. That's great. And I'm sure he's getting paid off of those, which is even better for a student athlete who's normally broke. Ball batted down, intercepted. Stacy Kirby with the INT for USF. Not just an INT, a, a very athletic. You see him there uh, rushing at the top of your screen. The awareness, stop, bats the ball up and then catches it. <laughs> That's a highlight for sure as uh, the Bulls really have done a better job. But the reality of it is, is, you know, this game was over, in my opinion, in the first four drives. I mean, when you, you get them a three and out and then they come back and rip off 21 points and, and then 28, really, at that point the game was over. But and this team is still fighting and you're seeing some freshmen get some reps, some confidence. This is a young team for Charlie Strong. And, and hopefully maybe some of these young guys will get the confidence to be able to move up into that mix and really be contributors at the beginning of a game. USF has to find a way to reverse the current trend. I would agree. They were 17-2 and two in Charlie Strong's first 19 games. About to go to 1-9 since then, and the only win against an FCS school. Barnett downfield, incomplete. Yeah, and you start to look at the future schedule for the Bulls, the non-conference. And Alabama, they've got Alabama. Personal foul, illegal hands to the face. Defense, number 93. 15-yard penalty, automatic first down. Yeah, they've got Alabama, Florida, Miami, Boise State, and even a showdown next year with Charlie's old team, Texas. So this is this is something that you want to hope, you hope these guys grow up really fast because you don't want them to lose confidence and, and if you're Charlie Strong, if his players lose confidence, it could be a situation where he and his staff lose a job. Yeah, today was a showdown between Charlie Strong and his old quarterback. And Shane Bouchelle took a victory lap. Barnett, again, going downfield looking for six. Incomplete, he wanted Ford. Actually, that was Xavier Weaver. Shane Bouchelle and Charlie Strong had their fates connected at Texas when Bouchelle was named the starter in 2016. Uh, he was looked to as the savior of that program. Yeah. This is the quarterback that Texas finally has. And, man, there was so much promise that first game. Notre Dame, national TV, the great proclamation yep. by Joe Tess. Texas is back, and we all <laughs> thought they were. Yeah. And then a few weeks later, they lose to a Cal team coached by Sonny Dykes, the head coach currently of the Mustangs. And then a loss to Kansas sealed Charlie Strong's fate. He was done after the season. Bouchelle lost his job to Sam Ellinger last year, but he has been one of the top transfers in all of college football this year. He's put up big numbers, and today, a tour de force. Yeah, look, our colleagues put out an article on the top transfer quarterbacks, and I think you've got to throw them right in this mix. I realize that Kelly Bryant at Missouri is doing a great job, Jacob Eason. But listen, 
his numbers, what he's brought to this team. And I'm even more convinced after listening to Sonny Dykes talk about the stuff he does off the field and the way he's really brought this bunch together. And, you know, listen, Shane Bouchel, you won't hear a Texas fan say something bad about his character, um, his demeanor when uh, demoted, any of those things. And keep in mind, Sam Ellinger is a pretty good player. So he lost his job to a guy that, that, that really is one of the best quarterbacks in the country. And he's proving right now, when you start looking at the, the statistics, he's one of the best in most categories for quarterbacks. And today proving that once again, and, and I'm really happy for this young man because it's a great story. He did things the right way, and now he's been rewarded um, in this SMU program. And the history of SMU football, you go back to the old days, Don Meredith and Doak Walker, there's a proud history. And for younger fans, yeah. now this was one of the teams, in large part because of the death penalty, that was left out when the Big 8 expanded and added four teams from the old Southwest Conference. They were left out with TCU and Houston and Rice, and they never quite recovered from those two years of not playing football. But you go back to the early 80s, the late 70s, the Pony Express. This was a program that was talked about in the same vein the way we talk about in Ohio State or Oklahoma today. They were a national program. Now, it's going to take some work to get back to those heights, but a chance to be ranked and to play in big games and to draw big crowds and bring new fans to your program. There's a tremendous opportunity awaiting SMU in 2019 that could do wonders long term for this program. I agree. Barnett, was he ruled down? He wasn't ruled down, but he looked down. And now he's down. Oh, Pounds the turf, and boy, you hope he's not hurt. Is that horse collar? I couldn't tell where he had him, where he drug him down from. Last thing you want in a game that's been decided is to lose a player to injury, and that is a horse collar. Yeah, no question about it. Toby and Dukeway. What in the world is going on here? This officiating crew that has been a, great, but they missed that, that one. That is a clear horse collar tackle. And I think Barnett was upset that they didn't call it. Well, I would be too. That's a dangerous play to make. And I mean, when you got a big guy like that coming down on you, uh, you know, that's not good. It'll go as a sack, the ninth by SMU. Second and 18, 35 seconds to go. Now the officials will discuss. Most of the crowd has cleared out long ago. Barnett standing in the pocket, gets hit again, and that interception is dropped. Richard McBride nearly had his first pick as an SMU Mustang. It's third and long, and uh, Barnett right now taking some unnecessary hits. He didn't move as well in the pocket. Watch him here. He, I, I think that leg's bothering him, and, and, you know, he just, and he's sitting there trying to sit tall and throw the ball downfield. The, the officials really missed a call, and you hope this young man isn't injured long term, but that was a, that was a, that was a poor call. And now you can see him, he's, he's, he's gimpy on that leg. Chris Budden told us earlier that Jordan McLeod, who started today, was having some wrist issues. Screen set up, Gennard Phillips. And that should be the final play. Now we get a timeout by the Bulls. It will be a 30 second timeout. Really? Okay. <laughs> SMU next week will play Tulsa. The Boulevard should be popping. <laughs> and Gerald Ford Stadium You're right. should have some electricity because there's a real chance this team could be ranked. Look at the FPI win percentage yeah. in that far right. right column. They are a favorite in every game but the road game at Memphis. And at 43%. That's not that far removed right. from a toss-up. This has a chance to be a special, potentially a historic season for SMU football. Yeah, two things. Temple, be careful with them. And then also at Navy. I think those are two yep. games where the percentages could be uh, a little less in their favor. But the reality of it is you said it. And the FBI, FPI is something that is it's pretty accurate. <laughs> and so 
Uh, but I like what I saw today. I, I, coming into this ball game, we were all questioning Sonny Dykes and this SMU team, and is it for real? And I'm leaving here with the impression that they certainly are. They can score points, and they can play good defense. Barnett is sacked the 10th by this SMU defense, and the Mustangs are 5-0 for the first time since 1983. It is a turnover on down, so they will have to take a kneel down. But they are stirring some echoes. Yep. And they've got a chance to bring some fans back and a chance to certainly win some new ones. Sonny Dykes, a man with a plan. You know, and you brought the question up to Sonny Dykes, can this team handle now being in the spotlight? And now that's your question. Do you have enough leaders on this ball team, enough humble guys that will still stay hungry and work and be 1-0, and as Shane Bouchel has said, all year long? We just want to be 1-0 and each and every week. If they can do that, at the end of the year, the Mustangs will be in the mix for an American um, conference title. And in addition to that, who knows, as we're talking here, that they've got a greater chance in the Pac-12 out of this conference to be in the college football playoffs. Yeah, it's a team we could certainly be, see, be seeing playing in a New Year's Six Bowl. Sonny Dykes and Charlie Strong. Last time they met after the game 2016, one was at Cal, the other at Texas. Shane Bouchelle was Charlie Strong's quarterback that day. Wow. Today, a tremendous performance against his old coach. Chris with Sonny Dykes. Coach, you didn't know how your team would respond to all of the hype. You saw out there today how they respond. Yeah, I thought we started really well. Uh, played really well the first half. Is, uh, Happy with the way the guys played. Got a little sloppy in the second half. We played a lot of young players, but I thought, uh, you know, I thought we were focused. Thought the guys did a great job of preparing during the week. So I was pleased with the, I was pleased with the effort. In a game that could have been emotional for Shane going up against his former coach. What did you see out of him today? Well, I thought he was really steady, particularly early in the game. I think he was like 15 or 16 or something to, to start the game. I thought he played really well and. You know, he's been the guy for us. We got him hit too many times. We got to get that fixed. But, uh, but I thought he played well and, and really did a good job of leading our offense. You head back to Dallas at 5-0. and What's allowed for so much success in just your second year? Well, we got a lot of good players, and, and they're really playing hard. And, um, you know, they're buying in. And, and so it's a lot of fun to coach these guys. I really enjoy, enjoy being around them every day. And they're a great bunch of kids. And we'll just keep getting better. Appreciate it. Congratulations. Okay. Thank you very much. Shane Bouchel was tremendous three touchdown passes he ran for another score shane come back <laughs> shane's going back to dallas with the best smu team in more than three decades the mustangs are five and oh for the first time since 1983 they could suit up as a ranked team next week for the first time since 1986 might be some magic in Big D <laughs> the next two months. For Ahmad Brooks and Chris Budden, I'm Anish Shroff. Now to ESPN Goal Line.